I have a quorum present, Mr. President. Thank you. Are there any messages, reports, or announcements? Or Mr. Corrections? President, uh, no corrections. I do have the uh, lobby report as required by state law to be inserted in a journal. Also, acknowledgement of the receipt of certain agency reports available to members on the legislative website. That's all that I have, Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. We will proceed to the first item on the agenda. Mr. President, Legislative Bill 268 is a bill by Senator Chambers. It's a bill for an act relating to crimes and offenses. It amends numerous sections. It changes provisions relating to murder in the first degree. It changes the penalty from death to life imprisonment without possibility of parole. It eliminates the homicide case report provisions on capital punishment, proportionality review provisions, and obsolete provisions. The bill was introduced on January 14, referred to the Judiciary Committee. I do have committee amendments, Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. Senator Chambers, you are recognized to open on LB 268. Thank you. Mr. President, members of the legislature, I've attempted on numerous occasions to persuade the legislature to abolish the death penalty. It always is a very somber affair for me. I view it something like a trial, as I look at it, with the death penalty being the item in the dock <laughs> to be gotten rid of. I was surprised at the number of people who signed on the bill. I was pleasantly surprised at the press conference that was conducted in the rotunda yesterday by people who label themselves, and I guess other people do too, as conservatives. So it's clear that unlike so many times in the past, I'm not going to have to carry the whole burden myself, which frees me to take a different approach. There was very compelling testimony during the hearing, and I wish every senator could have been there or could have heard it. That was not feasible because senators had other places to be other things to do. So I'm going to read some of that testimony into the record. There was only, only one opponent, and that was Don Klein, the Douglas County County Attorney representing the County Attorney Association. The most critical testimony he made, first of all, he said he agreed with much of what had been said. He acknowledged that Nebraska, in effect, has no death penalty now. And he lamented the fact that the state cannot get its act together, that the penalty is on the books, but the state cannot figure how to carry it out. But I will read from that. Judge Reagan, who now is retired, was on the district bench in Sarpy County. His testimony is particularly significant from my point of view and others who heard him. He emphasized the unique perspective that he had as a judge, not only was he involved with panels that imposed the death penalty? But he opposes it. He opposes it. He said while on the bench, he could not express that. But he mentions that there are other judges he has talked to and to a person. They wish the legislature would abolish the death penalty. The judges don't like it. They don't like the time that it takes. They see the arbitrariness of the way it is imposed and carried out the time that is taken by the judges. He points out that there's no deterrent effect, but I don't want to preempt what his testimony concerns. I put on each of your desks an 18-page handout. I am not so naive that I think you will read all of that material. You have other things to do. But if you just go through it and look at some of the headlines and see the subject matter, it is just, I want to add, a small, very small amount of the information that I've accumulated, not just down through the years, but in the past two years. The botched executions, the people who have been taken off death row, who were actually innocent, things of that kind. So this will, on my part, 
not be one of those ordinary discussions I would engage in on an issue that means as much to me as this one. People basically may have their mind made up. There may be some who are wavering. But at any rate, I don't know what to say that would sway somebody at this late date away from supporting the death penalty. But there are things that I want to get into the record. And the only way some of this testimony can really be a part of a record that may be viewed by people is for it to be placed in the record during this floor debate on this bill. Obviously, I want to get as many votes as I can to abolish this penalty. As has been stated frequently, the United States is the only Western country, the only democracy, Western, which retains the death penalty. The tragedy, I think, does not necessarily inhere in the types of countries and governments with which this country has aligned itself as far as the infliction of the death penalty, but the fact that over 150 people in the last few years have been taken off death row because they were innocent. I know there are people who want to believe that no innocent person has ever been executed in this country, but when you have this many people conclusively proved by DNA evidence to be actually innocent, there is no escaping the conclusion that innocent people indeed have been executed. There are cases where prosecutors withheld exculpatory information. They knew that there were bogus pieces of evidence introduced. They knew that there were defendants who were coerced into entering a guilty plea to a crime they had not committed by being told that you can't win if it goes to trial, so plead guilty, or at least no contest, and at least have a chance of saving your life. Well, if that person happened to be black or a poor white person, the death penalty would be imposed. When the defendant or the convicted person at this point would want to recant the confession, in most cases, that was not allowed. The fact that it was stated is conclusive. It has been demonstrated that there have been prosecutors who utilized the death penalty for the purpose of advancing a political career. And as a result, cases were not handled properly. There is a Texas district attorney who on his own is conducting a review of all past convictions where there may be something wrong, ordering DNA testing, new ballistic tests, and it's the only case in history that anybody knows of, where, and they are, one of the articles is in there, where a man was found not guilty, absolutely innocent, as a result of tests initiated by the prosecuting attorney. This man had given up all hope. He had been on death row for decades. No, this one wasn't on death row. He was serving time for, well anyway, the article is there and you'll see where this DA is conducting these tests, having them taken. The man said he thought his name would never be cleared. So he didn't even ask for the tests. But in going through the evidence, the uh, DA determined that this man could not have done the crime. The evidence they had did not connect him with the crime. They had some ballistics tests and some material that all those years ago they said could be traced to a gun found in his home. When after all those years that gun was tested for the first time, that gun was not the one from which the shots had been fired. And this man said, I should not have had to sit all those years on death row, and all they would have had to do was test the gun. But they chose not to. These are the things 
that have caused a lot of people, and I mean in law enforcement, in prosecutors' offices, judges One who supported the death penalty to alter their position. They wanted to believe that the trials were fair, that on such an important matter, there would not be the withholding of evidence, the framing of people, and the things that have been shown. In that packet of information, you will see some of those examples. And I will end my closing at this point because my time has run out. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Chambers. Member, Senator, member Senator Campbell would like to recognize the family physician of the day, Dr. Weirman, under the North Balcony. Please rise and be recognized by your Nebraska legislature. Welcome. Senator Seiler, you are recognized open on the committee amendments to the bill. Mr. President, members of the unicameral, our committee amendment 754 advanced from the Judiciary Committee by a unanimous 8-0 vote. We, at the hearing, we had 14 proponents, one opponent, and no neutral. AM 754 would eliminate the Class I felony classification and corresponding penalty. This would change the maximum penalty for first-degree murder from death to life imprisonment. The committee amendment strikes several provisions from the green copy of the bill, including legislative findings stated in Section 1. The amendment also strikes Section 22 through 25 and would, uh, would amend the procedures for addressing aggravating and mitigating factors in the first-degree murder sentencing procedures. There's numerous um, um, uh, numbers of uh, amendments to this uh, section of this amendment, and uh, one of the uh, committee members will be talking at length on that. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Seiler. Mr. Clerk, for announcement. Well, Mr. President, I now have a series of amendments to the committee amendments. Senator McCoy, I have AM 916 with a note you wish to withdraw. 917 you wish to withdraw, Senator, and 918. Mr. President, Senator Kittner would move to amend the committee amendments with AM 926. Senator Kittner, you are recognized to open on your amendment to the committee amendment. I wish to uh, withdraw 926 and, and uh, file it on select file. Seeing no objection, I'll we'll move that to select file. Mr. Clerk. Mr. President, the next amendment to the committee amendment, Senator Kittner, AM 990. Senator Kittner. Well, thank you, Mr. President. You know, before I talk about the details of this amendment, I want to share my thoughts about this monumental bill that is before us today. I remember my first year as a senator when Senator Chambers brought this bill to repeal the death penalty. The issue is serious, the intensity of the issue is immense. There are sincerely held beliefs on both sides of this issue. Clearly I've decided that the death penalty is a sanction that is required for the most heinous of crimes. I anticipate that we will hear a lot of data and numbers today. We'll hear assertions that this bill will save the state money. We will hear that the state should just pass the bill if we aren't going to use the death penalty anyway. Will we hear a lot of data? Well, what we won't hear is we won't hear claims that any of the 11 convicted murderers who are currently on Nebraska's death row are innocent. That's right, there might be many examples mentioned from other states about the doubt of killing an innocent person, not here in Nebraska, because unlike other states, there is absolutely no claim of actual innocence of any of these murderers. The target of my amendment is to strike the section of the committee amendment that would repeal the death penalty. Essentially, my amendment would restore the death penalty to the bill in order to keep the sanction in law. I listened to a lot of the discussion leading up to today's first round debate. Our citizens are watching us closely on this issue, and it's an issue that Nebraskans care about. 
Our law enforcement officials care about what happens on this bill. This is important stuff. Our prosecutors care what happens on this bill. The families of the victims of the 11 murders care what happens on this bill. This isn't a bill to give a technical vote for an order to move it along. This isn't a bill to give to Senator Chambers so that he won't hold up the rest of the session. This isn't a bill to give a vote in exchange for a deal on another bill that might matter more to you personally. This is a serious issue, and we need to take it straight on. It's a difficult issue. It's an issue that pretty much does not leave the room, leave us much room to compromise. That will make this debate difficult. I hope that our colleagues who share my opinion on this bill can provide you with the data that will convince you to keep the death penalty for those rare instances in which it is called for. Well, uh, thank you, uh, Mr. President and colleagues. Um, I uh, appreciate you listening, and I look forward to a thoughtful debate. Thank you, Senator Kittner. Members, you've heard the opening on the amendment to the committee amendment. Those in the queue wishing to speak, Senator Koash, Senator Epke, Senator Christ, and others. Senator Koash, you are recognized. Thank you, Mr. President. Good, good morning, colleagues. And I want to publicly thank Senator Kittner for his tone on on this debate. This is the kind of tone that we should have when we talk about something as, as serious as this. This is no joke. I want to talk to you colleagues about my own journey as to how I came to, to be a supporter of this bill. Many years ago as a, as a college student there was a, an execution to take place here, not too far from where I lived. And I made a trip down to the state penitentiary because I thought that would be something to see, to be part of justice, to be part of an execution. And when I went down there, there were two sides uh, of people that were there to witness. And there was a side there that thought it was a party. And they had a barbecue. And they had a countdown like it was New Year's Eve. And they had a band. Can you imagine that, colleagues? A band at an execution? And on the other side of that parking lot were people who were quietly praying, trying to be a witness to life, trying to understand how their government could end a life. And I was on the wrong side of that debate that night, and I never forgot it. And I didn't at the time anticipate being part of state government, but I always thought if I ever had the opportunity, I would, I would not be on that side of the debate again. I would not be part of a, of a bloodlust. The death penalty is not justice, it is revenge. Senator Kittner talked about some victims, and I want to talk about some victims as well. I've, I've talked to some victims, and I don't want to speak for all of them. They all have their own journeys, and they all feel differently. But the victims I've talked to look me in the eye and they say, when the government says there's going to be a sentence for the crime that they committed against my loved one and then they don't do that, where's the justice in that? Where's the justice in a sentence that is never carried out? And how do you think it makes me feel when because of the system Every time there's something brought up about an execution, we talk about the perpetrators. And it revictimizes me and my family. And where's the justice in that? What LB 268 does 
is it says to victims, this is about you. And you get justice that was handed down. And no more will people talk about the people who did this to your family. We should focus on victims. And that's the focus I want to, I want to give. Colleagues, at the end of the day, I believe that 268 is a good government bill. One minute. Thank you, Mr. President. I know many of you, when you went door to door, you said to the constituent you talked to, you send me to Lincoln, and when I get down there, I'm going to find government programs that don't work, and I'm going to get rid of them. I'm going to find government programs that we don't use, yet cost us money, and I'm going to get rid of them. And that's exactly what LB 268 does. It eliminates something that we don't need. We can get justice without this method. And I appreciate those of you that see it that way. I respect those of you that see it differently. But I would ask you to consider what LB 268 is and vote accordingly. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Coash. Senator Ebke, you are recognized. Thank you, Mr. President. I rise today in support of LB 268 and Committee Amendment 754. And I understand that many of my friends in this body see this issue very differently than I do. So I thought I might try to trace my evolution on this question as just as Senator Coash did. In August of 1983, my husband and I moved to Omaha where he was to begin med medical school. I intended to work part time and finish up my college degree. And in September of that year, John Jubert, who was later convicted of killing two young boys in Sarpy County and his, cr and his crimes had just come to light. In 1983, I was 21 years old and a small town girl living in the big city. For all I knew, Bellevue and Papillion were just blocks from UNMC, which we lived near. And we were careful about locking our doors. We went nowhere at night. And when the police caught Jubert some months later, I have a very clear memory of saying, they should just fry him tomorrow. I can't pinpoint the exact turning point in my views about the death penalty. I think a combination of things happened over the course of the next 20 years to turn me into a person who had very serious reservations about the death penalty. As my faith grew, and I know and respect that people of faith can have different positions on this issue, I felt pulled in the direction of believing that a death penalty, while perhaps once a necessary means for protecting civil society, was really not needed given our prison systems. For me, and perhaps only for me, the faith that informed my personal views on the question of abortion, which says that life is endowed by God, couldn't be reconciled in my mind with capital punishment when other means of punishment were available. Friends, we don't live as nomads. We are settled. And with that settlement comes a means of locking people away who are a danger to society. During the time when I was moving in this direction, though, we also began to see the advent of DNA testing. And with it came the exoneration of people who were sitting on death row. And even in a few cases, people who were put to death for crimes that they did not commit. I've handed out a packet of materials, several packets of materials that are being handed out now. And um, one of those things is an op-ed piece written by former Lincoln Police Captain and current Lancaster Emergency Management Director Jim David Saber. While I'm sure that not everyone in these professions agree, there is a significant body of opinion by people intimately connected with law enforcement and the criminal justice system, which I think suggests a few things worthy of note. First, the purported deterrent effect of the death penalty is probably an illusion at best. The fact is, or it seems to be, that people who commit these awful crimes don't think that they're going to get caught. Two, the death penalty is incredibly expensive. Assuming that the government respects the rule of law and being cognizant of civil liberties and wants to be sure that it doesn't put in innocent people to death, um, it's going to cost us some money. And three, 
Um, in one of the Gallup charts that I handed out, I believe it's on page three of the Gallup um, polling section, it's clear that while the percentage of people who favor the death penalty has remained somewhat constant for the last 15 years, the reasons why people um, affirm the practice of the death penalty has dispersed significantly. People can't agree on why we, should, why we should have a death penalty. Is it for revenge? Is it because that's just a good punishment? Is it an eye for an eye? What is it? Um, and colleagues, I would argue that if we can at least agree on why we should put people to death, then perhaps we ought to think carefully about why we're doing it and, and not do it at all. One minute. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Epke. Those in the queue wishing to speak, Senator Christ, Senator Williams, Senator Schnorr, and Senator McCoy, and others. Senator Christ, you are recognized. Thank you, Mr. President. Good morning, colleagues, and uh, good morning, Nebraska. There are times when eloquence and fine speeches are due, and there are times when the fewer words that are said, the more is conveyed. From this morning's paper, and as a quote from a uh, press conference we had yesterday, I'll read my own words, and that's all I intend to say on this subject. <clears throat> I am Republican enough, I am conservative enough, and I am strong enough to follow through with my life convictions, which is life from conception to natural death. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Senator Christ. Senator Williams, you are recognized. Thank you, Mr. President, and uh, welcome this morning, colleagues. We deal with many tough issues in this body, many that are no more tough than this one. And for me personally, this is an extremely tough issue. I am on the Judiciary Committee, so I was fortunate enough to be there and hear all of the witnesses testify that you have heard about today. And that has helped me in forming my opinion on this issue. Many of the issues that we talk about here and the bills that come up, when you go back to your district, people don't necessarily have an opinion on them. But as we all know, this particular issue is an issue that everyone has an opinion on and a view on. And oftentimes those opinions and views may be based on different perceptions than the reality that those 49 of us that are sitting in this body have to realize. Because at the end of the day, whether that's Monday, Tuesday, whatever day it is next week. We have two choices. We have a red button and a green button. And we will be asked to push one of those buttons on a tough issue. For me, it's been difficult. But at this point, I fully support LB 268 with the committee amendment AM 754. And the reason I do that is, is fairly simple for me. The statistics that go into this, since the early 1900s in Nebraska, we have convicted 72 people that have been sentenced to capital punishment in our state. During that period of time since then, we've executed 23. Right now, we have 11 that are on death row, and we have not executed a person in Nebraska for over 18 years. And the plain fact is that currently, with our system of execution, we don't have a system available to carry out that verdict. So I look at that and say, what does this mean for us? We really never do it. So why are we spending the time and the effort to worry about it. The second thing that I jump into is the cost. And the cost number is counterintuitive to those of us that work with numbers, and I've had that opportunity all my life, because there's the assumption that just jumps out at you that it has to cost more to keep someone in prison for life than it does to execute them. The plain fact is, if you look statistically at it, the cost of the legal 
appeal system, the three-judge panel, everything that we go through to protect innocent people's rights costs substantially more. In fact, the figures seem to show that it costs about three times as much to execute a person as it does to convict them to life imprisonment without parole. It's also clear from the testimony we received and the independent research that I have done that the death penalty does not work as a deterrent to the crime. So we lose that as an argument to maintain the death penalty. One minute. And then the one that jumps out at me and really grabs me is the statistic that in the United States since 1973, 143 people that were on death row have had their convictions overturned because of DNA evidence that was not available at the time of their conviction. 143 people that were released that could have been and may well have been executed. As I said, at the end of the day, we have two choices. We have a red button and a green button. I'm not going to go around and try to convince anybody to change their mind on this issue because this one is in your soul. And I ask each one of us to use our best judgment for the future of our state on this issue. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Williams. Senator Snore, you are recognized. Thank you, Mr. President. We're going to hear a lot of information today about uh, the cost of this, about uh, we've already heard that. We've already heard about uh, uh, innocent victims that are being put to death. And, and all of that is, uh, is wrong. It's absolutely wrong. There is not one per person here on death row that has been exonerated or proved innocent. Uh, the amount of appeals is astounding. But uh, the amount of appeals for our capital offenses are 34. That's it, 34. Do you know how many appeals there are for non-capital offenses? Does anybody know? 5,943. So when you say this is a, a uh, cost savings, it's wrong. And do you know who handles the appeals? Our Department of Justice. They are all salaried employees. There's no extra cost. Uh, they're still just doing their normal job, and actually, it is a very small percentage of what they do. 5,943, and only 34 appeals for those on death row. That's the difference. So to say that the cost is uh, unbearable is just false. It's 100% false. And uh, Senator Koash talked about uh, death penalty is revenge. Uh, I would agree with them if it was me taking out that action. If somebody killed one of my children or one of my family, that's exactly what I'd want to do. And, uh, and that is revenge. But that's not what the Bible tells us. Uh, you know, we all... We talk about Christianity and our Christianity beliefs. Well, I want to read some Bible verses for you that talks about this. Uh, Exodus 21 talks about an eye for an eye. Numbers 35, whoso killeth any person, the murderer shall be put to death by the mouth of the witnesses. That's how we live. That's how our, our uh, constitution was formed based on these beliefs. And we talk about, uh, about innocent life I, I believe in it, or we talk about pro-life. I am a pro-life person, but I am pro-innocent life. I am pro-life for the, that baby that has no choice. I am pro-life for these victims that didn't have a say. But I am not pro-life for these murderous savages. Because we will give you stories of what has happened in our state. And they are sickening. 
They are absolutely sickening. Like the story of Michael Ryan. And I, I, I'll warn you, this is nasty. This is, this is absolutely nasty. But you need to know this because these are the people that we're trying to, uh, I guess, protect. Ryan was a leader of a group characterized as both a religious cult and a band of criminals living on a farm outside of rural Nebraska. And this happened back in 1989. I wasn't around. I was in the military. Uh, my dad told me about it, but that's what, what I know it, uh, is the, the actual information I have here. In preparation for the Battle of Armageddon, Ryan and a member of his cult committed stealing raids in the states of Kansas, Missouri, and Nebraska over a period of two years. Uh, a young cult member, James Tim, expressed doubts about Ryan's uh, uh, communication with Yahweh, uh, what, Ryan, what he called his God. Ryan referred to Tim and other young doubters as the group of slaves. And over a period of months, Ryan kept Tim chained to a trailer. He forced Tim to engage in anal sex with other members of the cult. Now, I got to warn you, I, I'm not comfortable talking about this, but this is the truth. This is what has happened in our state. One day, Ryan instructed Tim to disrobe and bend over a farrowing crate. A farrowing crate is what's used for hogs. And please bear with me, this is nasty. They took a shovel handle and shoved it in his rectum. Time, and then, Senator. Okay, I'm going to continue. Thank you, Senator Schnorr. Senator McCoy, you are recognized. Thank you, Mr. President and members. I rise this morning in strong opposition to LB 268, much the same way I did two years ago when we last faced this issue. This is at least the third time, I believe, that I've encountered this issue or dealt with the death penalty since I've been here in the legislature, including in 2009 when I was a part of a, a group of senators, most are no longer in the legislature, who spearheaded the move to lethal injection in our state. I want to read the words of two former senators, words that were spoken on this floor in 2008, in the middle of my first run for the legislature, and I think they're particularly timely this morning. The first is from Florida Bay on March 25th of 2008, Senator Tom White. I quote, this was in regards to his opposition to the repeal of the death penalty. My religion teaches, though, that killing is permitted in one circumstance, and that is to defend the life of innocent people yourself or others. That is the only time killing is permitted. I cannot support this bill because though not frequent, there are substantial examples of inmates who remain, who simply remain too dangerous to be left alive. There's well-documented incidences of inmates who have repeatedly killed other inmates or guards. There are well-documented incidents of people who have been convicted or awaiting trial who have caused murders to be committed against judges prosecuting attorneys and witnesses. Killing sometimes in very rare circumstances the only moral course. The man who is in prison and also has a right to find salvation and life in prison and not be afraid that he will be killed in his cell, that the guard trying to keep society safe not be worried that a murderer who will never get out can murder and murder again without any additional consequence. The justice system, as imperfect as it may be, cannot be corrupted by people committing murders from prison to avoid punishment. Given that, in my experiences, I cannot vote for this. Despite life imprisonment, they remain too dangerous to be left alive. The next the next senator's words that I want to read, same day, Senator Scott Lautenbach. I will not stand here and question the motives of those who want to repeal capital punishment. They have their reasons, and we disagree. 
When I hear some of my colleagues suggest that those of us who oppose this bill are doing so, so we can say we're tough on crime, I get angry, very angry. I am pro-life. I consider myself to be strongly pro-life. But when you violate our society's most deeply held rules, there is an ultimate sanction that I believe is appropriate. You can be pro-freedom and still favor incarceration when a crime is committed. That doesn't make you anti-freedom. That means you're in favor of appropriate punishment. I consider myself to be a pro-life person, and I consider myself an opponent of these bills and these amendments. Well, I wholeheartedly concur with both the words of Senator White, in this case, and Senator Lautenbach. And those of you who have either been watchers of the legislature, one minute, or a member of the legislature for the length of time that I have, or longer, know that Senator White and Senator Lautenbach rarely ever agreed on much. Sometimes I disagreed with both of them or either one of them, as the case warranted. But I rise this morning to agree with what they said. The death penalty is appropriate punishment for the worst of the worst who commit the most heinous crimes possible against Nebraskans. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator McCoy. Mr. Clerk, for an announcement. Mr. President, the Business and Labor Committee will meet an executive session at 10 o'clock in room 2022. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. Those wishing to speak in the queue, Senator Kittner, Senator Brosh, Senator Bloomfield, Senator Cook, and others. Senator Kittner, you are recognized. Well, thank you, Mr. President. Um, you know, I uh, came down here. I ran because I thought taxes were too high. I thought spending was out of control. And here I find myself standing up to help lead the effort to give our prosecutors and attorney general and law enforcement people a tool that they need to bring justice in our state. I'd rather be talking about taxes. I'd rather be talking about the family budgets of each Nebraskan. I'd rather be uh, talking about uh, places that we can cut spending. But we're talking about the um, death penalty. But I am uh, pretty much known as a fiscal hawk. I don't uh, want to spend money we don't have to spend. And let, let me just make sure that we're clear that putting someone to death does not cost substantially more than putting someone on death row. You have the same cost to incarcerate somebody. You have, you have no additional cost on the appeals because the Attorney General's staff are on salary. I know that. My wife used to work there for six years and it doesn't matter what case she was she was working on, she got paid the same amount. The electricity still has to be paid. The rent still has to be paid. There's no additional cost uh, to defend against these crazy appeals. And when the opponents of death penalty uh, appeal it and endlessly appeal it and endlessly appeal it and endlessly appeal it and then they come back and they tell us it doesn't work. Well, I think that's a circular argument. They're the ones that are costing so much money and now they're telling us it doesn't work and it costs a lot of money. What well, doesn't cost a lot of money? The, let me say it again. The cost to put someone to death, if we actually put them to death, it's a lot cheaper than keeping someone for life. And if we just go with endless appeals, the cost is about the same. There is no cost difference. Senator Williams said this is a matter of the heart. Well, some of my, my uh, colleagues have flat out told me it's a matter of dollars and cents. So if it's a matter of dollars and cents, there's not a dollars and cents reason to get rid of the death penalty. And when someone says it costs three times as much, that is absolutely as false as can be. Absolutely as false as can be. Um, now, I want to kind of walk through how a death penalty in the judicial review process. You start out with direct review. There's a trial in state district court, mandatory direct appeal to Nebraska Supreme Court, mandatory. Petition for a writ of, and I, I, I all ask the uh, professor over here, Senator Schumacher, I say it, 
uh, Santoria to the Supreme Court of the United States. And I'm sure it's the Senator uh, Shoemaker came up and said me how, how, how to, how to, uh, to uh, pronounce that. And then we go through a state post-conviction review, post-conviction motion in state district court. Then we have appeal to Nebraska Supreme Court. And then we have another uh, petition to United States Supreme Court. Then we have a federal habeas cor corpus review, uh, and it's a petition to federal district court, and it goes to an appeal to United States District Court of the Eighth Circuit. And then we have another petition that goes right to the Supreme Court. So now the Supreme Court's looked at U.S. Supreme Court for a third time. And then you have some other litigation that could affect it. They could do an a petition for additional DNA testing, and that would be heard in the district court and Court of Appeals, and One in the minute. state habeas corpus, that'd be a district court hearing and appeal. That is quite a process. Uh, that is a, uh, if they stretch it out, that's a 10 to 15 year process right there. You have every, every opportunity to prove your innocence. That's why we never had a person in our state on death row that they found that we wrongly uh, convicted him and put him on death row. We'll be back to talk again. Uh, thank you for the time, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Kittner. Senator Brosh, you are recognized. Thank you, Mr. President, and uh, good morning, colleagues. Uh, I want to assure uh, Senator Koash that as we address the death penalty, there is no joy in this. There are no bans, there are no picnics, uh, none of the activities that uh, unfortunately he witnessed. Um, I imagine it was many years ago. There's nothing to be made light of here. Those of us who oppose this bill, and yes, I do oppose it and the amendment, because I remember all too well of the innocent lives taken in Norfolk, Nebraska, not that long ago. And I remember, as Senator McCoy did, other debates where Speaker Flood at that time, his district was Norfolk, the horrific events that happened there, the death penalty is justice for innocent lives that were taken horrendously, horrifically for the families that were left behind the pain. In Norfolk, Nebraska, one of the state troopers three days after that event committed suicide with great despair, believing that had he done um, a gun check on one of the shooters, perhaps that would not have happened. He is not to blame. And to take you back to uh, when Speaker Flood and I both well remember, there was an article that's, that uh, the headline is 10 years after the Norfolk bank robbery, a time to remember. And um, it's written by one of the survivors and Sue Steyer had said that she hadn't spoken publicly about what happened because it was so horrific. But I want people to remember that people were there. People like Lisa Bryant, 29 of Norfolk, Lola Elwood, 43 of Norfolk, Joe Ma Mossbach, 42 of Humphrey, Samuel Sun, 50 of Norfolk, Yvonne Tuttle, 37 of Stanton. And Sue says, I think a lot about them during church, and I think about them at events, like when I go to a wedding, and I think how Lola didn't get to go to her daughter's wedding. Sam didn't get to go to his son's graduations. Those kind of things. I think I'm lucky I got to go to mine. She also wrote, in remembrance to those who remain and who died, what happened? She said it was like any other day. Her coworkers, their customers were going about their routines. 
They had breakfast, their kids were dropped off at school, their errands run, hugged and kisses shared. And then as I read on, it talks about that, and she's speaking from her hearts, all of it ended after 40 seconds. There was no need for a DNA test. It happened. Witnesses, on camera, the events were real. We're talking about punishment that is just for the crime. One minute. Senator Koash also meant, when he mentioned the, the, the lightness, many of us have received mailings that equated members here to the Wizard of Oz. Um, I even had a mailing against my pastor, his photograph, talking about uh, we need to talk to God. Faith is just. There are scriptures that give government the authority to execute those who would commit horrific, unquestionable crimes. We've seen the numbers here. It is not something that is uh, beyond our grasp fiscally or financially. It is within a budget. That's not true that the uh, past has said that this is something we can't afford. So there is no joy, there is no glory. It's protection of innocent life, innocent from conception to innocent Time, upon Senator. natural death. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Brosh. Senator Bloomfield, you are recognized. Thank you, Mr. President. Colleagues, this is an issue that rips all of us apart. I, at this moment, don't know how I'm going to vote on it. I will ultimately reach that decision when my name is called on the roll call vote. I will continue to listen. I will talk to proponents and opponents of this outside of the chamber. I will go home and beat the hell out of myself all weekend over this issue. And I can't tell you yet how I'm going to vote on it. I share the same anguish that Senator Brosh does, and I'm sure Senator Shear does, about the events in Norfolk. I remember the passion of Senator Flood when he spoke of the issue in Norfolk. I have always in the past come down on the side of keeping the death penalty. I don't know where I'm going to be this year. <clears throat> Excuse me. Those of you who are, have been here know that I wrestle with this every year. I go back to my mother's haunting words, the state should not take away a life until they have the ability to give it back. But there is justice that needs to be served, and Norfolk certainly cries out for that. I will continue to wrestle with myself on this. I will continue to listen. I may be listening out of the chamber, because sometimes it's quieter out of the chamber. I, like Senator Christ, will probably not speak on this issue again. I have been asked to yield time. I probably will not do that. Senator Chambers, I know, could use time, as could Senator I'm trying to think of Kittner's name back there, Senator Kittner could use time. I will struggle with this. I will make my decision when the light is turned on, or when, when required. And I will listen carefully. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, colleagues. Thank you, Senator Bloomfield. Senator Cook, you are recognized. Thank you, Mr. President, and good morning, colleagues. I rise in support of LB 268 and the underlying amendments. I have been a consistent opponent 
to the death penalty and have supported each bill proposal as it's come forward during my tenure in the legislature. Uh, I wanted to briefly offer some statistics as they relate to the application of the death penalty. I am not an attorney by training. Uh, I am, however, someone who's very interested in policy, inclusion, equity, as in terms of policy development and in terms of how our laws are practiced. Ladies and gentlemen, that is certainly not the case in the case of the death penalty. The death penalty is quite simply racially biased. Since 1977, the overwhelming majority of death row defendants, that's 77% of them, have been executed for killing white victims, even though African Americans make up about half of all homicide victims. I represent a district also in the state, as each of you do, Legislative District 13, and I know most of you might probably don't have access to regular access to electronic or network news outlets or newspapers about uh, Omaha. I'm certainly not bragging about it, but here's something else I can tell you about the death penalty. It is not a determinant, deter, deterrent to violent crime in the state of Nebraska. Uh, when I get reports either direct reports or learn about deaths and shootings and violence within my district. The death penalty has been on the books the whole time. It is not a deterrent to crime. And finally, I'd like a word. We've had a reference to um, our spiritual backgrounds and uh, how we apply them in our policy making. I also rise in support of LB 268, its advancement, because it is not our role as humans to be the deliverers of vengeance. And if you were to truly, let's say, ideally identify a person who has affected your family through murder or violence, the way our laws work, and the way our civil society works, you would not be able to deliver that, what you would determine to be justice, without due process. Colleagues, should anger be the basis of public policy, any public policy? In my view, it should not. With that, I would yield the balance of my time to the chair. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Cook. Those in the queue wishing to speak, Senator Craighead, Senator Kalowski, Senator Christ, Senator Hughes, and others. Senator Craighead, you are recognized. Thank you, Mr. President, and good morning, colleagues. There was a 2014 Gallup poll that said 63% of Nebraskans are in favor of the death penalty. 33% are opposed, and 4% have no opinion. I am opposed to the repeal of the death penalty for moral and societal reasons. I'd like to read a little bit more from one of the accounts of a victim who is unable to do so. And this kind of goes back to where Senator Schnorr left off. This is from the book Evil Harvest written by Rod Colvin on the, the murders in uh, rural Nebraska. Rod Colvin is a friend of mine. He also was the publisher of my book. According to the 1999 book, Evil Harvest by Rod Colvin, Michael Ryan, who currently sits on death row, was an unemployed truck driver who set up a commune in Richardson County, Nebraska, near Rulo. He posted a large keep out sign on the gate, gunfire was reported to authorities, and men armed with AK-47 automatic weapons patrolled the fence line. Ryan ordered some of the men to steal farm machinery and other goods to sell for supplies. The farm owner, Rick Stice, ran away. When he returned, Ryan had him chained to the front porch and beat him or had others beat him. Ryan also took out his anger on Stice's son, five-year-old Luke, who dared to defy the cult leader. Ryan forced the boy's father to sexually abuse him. According to witnesses, Ryan viol violently slammed the boy into a piece of furniture, knocking him unconscious. 
It did not kill him immediately, Colvin wrote, and Ryan instructed them to put him in a bed and pray for him. No one called a doctor. The boy's neck was broken, and he died. He was buried on the farm property. His body was exhumed and properly buried later. A few weeks later, Ryan turned his anger on another resident of the farm who, whom he accused of being a non-believer. The cult, la or, cult leader ordered three of the men, including Ryan's own teenage son, to administer beatings to 26-year-old James Thim. In the original Nebraska court ruling upholding Ryan's death sentence, the court summarized these events, and this is ugly. Thim was taken to a hog confinement building where, over a period of two days, the men took turns sexually assaulting with a shovel handle until his bowel ruptured, whipping Thim on the back and abdomen and shooting off the fingertips of Thim's left hand. Thim was chained or tied with bailing wire during much of the time. Michael Ryan also brought, broke Thim's arm permitted De Dennis Ryan to break Thim's left leg, and directed Timothy Haverkamp to break Thim's right leg. Michael Ryan then demonstrated to Timothy Haverkamp and Dennis Ryan how to skin a human being by using a razor blade and a pair of pliers to skin part of Thim's leg. Ultimately, Michael Ryan stomped on Thim's chest, breaking several of his ribs, and Thim died on April 29th, 1985. Thim's body was placed inside a sleeping bag and buried in an unmarked grave on the farm. Michael Ryan pleaded no contest to the murder of Luke Stice. A jury found him guilty for the murder of James Thim. Ryan told author Rod Colvin, people say two people died out there, well big deal. Go back to the Old Testament. Moses wiped out a whole family, babies and all. Now that's a pretty hard way to go, but he got rid of all of them. One minute. Thank you. Police raided the farm on June 25th, 1985, finding illegal weapons and ammunition, also stolen property. The bodies were unearthed in August 1985. Ryan was convicted of second degree murder for Luke's death and first degree murder for Thim. He received the death penalty on October 16, 1986, and is still on Nebraska's death row. Colleagues, please do not support the repeal of the death penalty. Thank, Thank you, you, Senator Craighead. Senator Kalowski, you are recognized. Thank you, Mr. President. Good morning, colleagues. I stand in support of the uh, LP. 268 we have before us and also the amendment uh, attached to that. We've had comments this morning concerning the uh, forensic approach to the law and the application of the science to the uh, Innocence Project and other projects that uh, have had great impact upon some of the court cases deciding directions on the guilt or innocence for many individuals. Part of what I want to read this morning is to put this into the record, uh, the need for strong forensic science in cases such as the ones we're hearing this morning or have been related to uh, the innocence projects and others uh, that have existed in our, in our state and in our country at many times. Evidence storage warehouses tend to be dusty, musty, cavernous enclosures. Shelving stretches to the ceilings. On those shelves sit brown paper bags and boxes covered in handwriting, edges sealed with layer upon layer of security tape affixed with biohazard and barcode labels. The evidence sits uncaring about the day that it was taken off the shelf, sent to a forensic laboratory, opened and examined. For many pieces of evidence, that day has yet to arrive, and in truth, that day may never come. The related cases will move forward in the investigative and judicial process. Victims, if alive, will testify. Defendants will take pleas or move to a trial to be judged by a jury of their peers. And for many cases, physical evidence sits untested 
and remained silent. Since the early 1900s, however, forensics DNA analysis has repeatedly demonstrated the ability to take this silent evidence and reveal truth. Sometimes that truth reinforces the original findings of the case and lends additional weight to the justice of a guilty verdict. Other times it speaks a different truth, a truth in which the subjectivity of eyewitness accounts, investigatory, investigatory biases and jury preferences are nullified, the truth in which the innocent can be set free. Forensic science is classically defined as the application of the scientific method to matters of the law. To the layperson, forensics can simply be thought of as the process of matching people, places, and things using modern science. The goal of forensics is twofold, identification and individualization. What is this thing presented as evidence and is there any way to prove the uniqueness of this thing apart from all other things like it? Classic forensics techniques such as the fingerprint analysis and firearm and tool mark examination have always been very good at accomplishing these dual goals of the forensics process. But the results of these pattern analysis methods have always depended upon the experience and expertise of latent print examiner or firearms analysis. Unlike the dramatic polarization of forensics in movies and TV, there is never a match in these fields. At One best, minute. thank you. At best, an evidentiary item cannot be excluded as having originated from the source, be that a finger or firearm originating from someone involved in the case. For over 100 years these, pattern, years, these pattern recognition aspects of forensics have provided scientific answers for criminal investigators and have yielded famous results within the limits of the present science. These limits, however, are true boundaries of the ability of the science to go beyond them when pressed by judges, juries, attorneys, and the general public, risks of credibility, risk the credibility of the expert. What are the odds that the fingerprint belonged to another individual? What is the statistical likelihood of a shell casing being impressed by a similar firearm from the same production line? These questions cross the ex uh, applicable boundary of science and when unanswered by the experts, raise doubts and concerns within the public. Time, Senator. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Kalowski. Senator Christ, you are recognized. Thank you, Mr. President. I yielded my time to Senator Kalowski so he can finish. Senator Kalowski, you are yielded five minutes. Thank you, Senator Chris. Forensic DNA analysis was the first to break through the barrier of the limitations of the expert. Unlike the multitude of fingerprint and firearms that have existed, the genetics of a population of individuals is finite and within scientific reason incredibly well understood. Today, based on population genetic studies, we now we know the prevalence of different DNA types nearly, of nearly every subpopulation on the face of the planet. From the general gen genetics seen within individuals of Western European descent to the specific genetic traits of isolated tribes in the Polynesian islands, the genetic diversity of the human race has been cataloged. This is an extremely important set of standards that have been established. Despite the gold standard status, forensic testing, including DNA testing, is under attack and facing unprecedented scrutiny. Across the country, evidence is piling up, creating untold backlogs for forensic laboratories that are understaffed, underfunded, and unable to meet the demands of the clientele seeking answers to these questions. At best, backlogs are simply resulting in evidence not being tested for several months, if not years, after a crime, causing untold delays in the judicial process. At worst, analysis under pressure to whittle down these backlogs have cut corners, sacrificed quality, and in some unfortunate and well-publicized instances, including some in our own state, have falsified results and published reports of testing that never had, had even occurred. While some of these regrettable actions have occurred in the forensic fields of document examination and drug testing, 
the forensic DNA field has not been immune either, with the unethical actions of a few reverberating throughout the entire forensic community. The laboratories, excuse me, all the while evidence remains untested, it is not enough simply to provide more money, more staff, more resources, more infrastructure, the entire system needs to change. There's been national reports that have stated foremost that science, forensic science laboratories have, have a need and must be independent from law enforcement. Secondly, forensic laboratories should be independently accredited. Thirdly, analysis must be certified, analysts, excuse me, must be certified to be forensic scientists. If accreditation promotes best practices for a laboratory, certification promotes the same for individual analysis. Doctors are certified to practice medicine and are responsible for the lives of their patients. Forensic scientists translate the findings of the scientific testing of physical evidence into reports that have the potential to implicate or exonerate a person, perhaps that person's very life. Yet to date, forensic scientists in a majority of the laboratories remain uncertified. I hope we'll examine the, the standards within our own state for the state levels and city levels of forensic testing and, and match ourselves with the, the directions and the policies that set perfect standards, excellent standards, that will give us the evidence that we need in cases in our own future. I hope this will be something that we'll take seriously and, and move on in our, in our future time together. Thank you very much. Thank you, Senator Kalowski and Senator Christ. Members, Senator Hansen had 15 members from the fourth grade class of the Trinity Lutheran School here. They were in attendance but had to leave. Senator Hughes, you are recognized. Thank you, Mr. President. Good morning, colleagues. This is the day that I've dreaded the most of being a state legislator. This is a very serious issue we're, we're talking about today. I am opposed to LB 286. I am in favor of retaining the death penalty. I re certainly respect all of my colleagues' opinions on this matter. I'd like Colby, I, I was in Lincoln the night of that execution. I did not attend uh, the uh, events at the penitentiary, but I do remember that. That's the one thing that all of us bring to this body, is our life experiences. For those of us in rural Nebraska, murders are just as real as they are in the cities of Nebraska. I can think of three instances where murders were, had occurred in my area. And one of those was recently when my children were in high school. I checked. <clears throat> Excuse me, I checked the house before I let them come in to make sure that there was no one hiding there. That does leave an impact on you. This is a very serious matter, and, and I take this decision very seriously. A few of the things that I want to address during the committee hearing, there was only one opponent. Which of us would want to go to that committee and face Senator Chambers as an opponent on this issue? He has been very staunch in his opposition, and I respect that. He's got a conviction, but he also has a reputation if you oppose him. The DNA technology is improving. Will it be perfect? Never. Are we as humans perfect? Never. But it is improving. And I appreciate the fact of all of the individuals who have been cleared using that technology. But that technology is improving and it's providing us the tools to make sure that we don't make those mistakes. We need to rely on the tools we have at the time and make the best decisions we can at the time with the facts that we have. This should not be an emotional decision for us, although it is. We need to make the best decision we can based on the facts and our life experiences. I do believe the death penalty does provide a deterrent. 
there is really no way of knowing of someone who's committing a crime if in the back of their mind they didn't pull the trigger in an armed robbery because they knew the death penalty was out there. Interviewing them after the fact, they can tell you anything. But in the heat of the moment, there's no way to know if there was something in the back of their mind that said, don't pull the trigger, don't pull the trigger. Or, you know, use the screwdriver to stab somebody, whatever, whatever the weapon of choice was. Colleagues, we're not going to be done with this today. We're going to have all weekend to think about it. If you haven't got your mind made up, it's going to be a long weekend. If you do have your mind made up, it's going to be a long weekend. Because this is life and death. This is why our voters sent us here to make this decision for them. We can look a lot of polling. You can pull facts from every side. One minute and come up with an opinion. But deep down in your soul, you've got to make the decision. I'll see you on Monday. Thank you, Senator Hughes. Those in the queue wishing to speak, Senator Davis, Senator Reapy, Senator Schnorr, Senator Groney, and others. Senator Davis, you are recognized. Thank you, Mr. President. Good morning, colleagues. <clears throat> I stood on the floor two years ago in support of repeal of the death penalty, and I'm taking the same position today. I'll probably reiterate some of the same points I made a few years ago, maybe add a few points. Several years ago, a couple was murdered in cold blood in Murdoch, Nebraska. Suspicion developed around their nephew, who'd been at their home for dinner shortly before, they, before the murder took place. The individual was brought in and questioned extensively, ultimately confessed to the murder, and indicted another friend who was also brought in and also confessed to the murder. Sometime later, as these the case began to unravel against these two men. Evidence was planted in a car by a criminal investigator. So what's important about that case? The fact is that those two young men who were innocent and the murder was convicted, committed by somebody else from Wisconsin. The link to those murders involved a ring that was found at the scene that was traced back to the girlfriend of the murderer. And without that ring, those two men might be on death row today. Two innocent men. Many years ago, a woman was murdered in Beatrice. And this case didn't end up going to the death penalty, but it ended up going to a false conviction. Six people were arrested for those crimes. Many of those people were low-functioning adults who had no knowledge of the criminal justice system or how it worked. They were scared, they confessed, they indicted other people, and they were convicted. And recently, the state of Nebraska is making restitution to those people. So what happened to them? The prosecutors threatened them with the death penalty if they refused to cooperate and confess. And they got scared, and they, they did what the prosecutors wanted them to do, because that's the nature of a lot of folks in the world who don't have the intelligence and the skills that people on the floor here have. They think that the books are stacked against them, and they're going to have to do it. So I'll confess, I just don't want to die. That's all. I don't want to die. Happened in the Murdoch case. Happened in the Beatrice case. Folks, that should give you some concern. So I've heard Senator Kittner say that the, that the people on death row here, that's a, it's an open and shut case. I'm not sure that's true. I think two of those people have claims that they are innocent still. And those convictions are maybe going to be reviewed. So we don't know. You know, if, if, uh, if a if you get indicted by uh, a friend who's going to be put away for 50 years for meth and he indicts you and you get convicted, is that right? There are a lot of problems with the system we have. And the use of the death penalty as a threat to secure that conviction is not right and it's one of the reasons that I stand opposed here to the death penalty. In Oklahoma, Joyce Gilchrist was a criminal investigator who manipulated evidence to secure convictions for prosecutors in that state. Many individuals were found guilty and locked away there based on Gilchrist's evidence. John Grisham has written a, one nonfiction book, and it's about a Gilchrist case. And it was the case of Ron Williamson, who with a friend was convicted of murder in Ada, Oklahoma. 
Served nine years on death row until he was exonerated. So on top of the potential for mistakes made willfully or by accident, there are other compelling reasons to eliminate the death penalty in Nebraska. Small counties staffed by seasoned prosecutors will probably be the least likely to ever impose the death penalty because they know the resources required to convict are so daunting and it's so costly. Other counties who have multiple prosecutors on staff may have the ability to do that. They, the small counties don't have that. One minute. Thank you, Mr. President. Black and Hispanic men are far more likely to be convicted and sentenced to death than white men. You heard Senator Cook make reference to that data earlier, and thank you, Senator Cook. We are a flawed society. It's the nature of man. Each and every one of us makes mistakes. Things fall through the cracks. We forget, and some of us fabricate occasionally and some intentionally. When a life is in danger, these mistakes must be considered and considered strongly. If a particular medicine killed 1% of the population that were taking it, that medicine would be removed from the market. But we don't use that same standard when we talk about things like the death penalty. We've got people all over the country who are there who are innocent. Maybe not a lot, but they're innocent. This is not the way a civilized society functions. False convictions, false confessions, the use of the death penalty as a threat, racial imbalance are significant contributors to my position. I'm pro-life, and that pro-life conviction will never include execution of any individual. Time, Senator. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Davis. Senator Reapy, you are recognized. Thank you, Mr. President, my fellow senators, my fellow Nebraskans. I stand in opposition of LB 268. Confusion appears to prevail in how one might be at the same time pro-life and pro-death. The difference is quite clear to me. On the one hand, we have pure innocence, the unborn, and on the other, pure evil. The definition of innocence, and this is from the, uh, the dictionary says, innocent, free, and moral, free from moral wrong, without sin, pure, innocent children, virtuous, faultless, impeccable, spotless, immaculate. It goes on to describe evil as sinful, depraved, vicious, corrupt, vile, wicked, unrighteous, corrupt, of the devil. I stand in support of the Innocent Project and the expanded availability of the DNA testing. I signed on as a co-sponsor of Senator Pazing Brooks' expanded DNA legislation and voted for its support. I have no interest in the execution of one individual that is innocent. My death penalty stance is reserved for the most heinous murders, the worst of the worst. On a second time at the mic, I will tell a story of a brutal murder with its convicted felon now on death row of a young boy from Scott's Bluff a three-year-old boy who was murdered and subsequently fed to a dog. With that, I will be back, and I would like to yield any time that I might have to Senator McCoy. Senator McCoy, you are yielded three minutes. Thank you, Mr. President, and thank you, Senator Reapy. Uh, in response to something that Senator Cook said earlier, I wanted to uh, mention to the body, I have a copy of the study. I'm happy to show it to anybody who would like to see it. Researchers from Clemson University and Emory University, uh, the, the study concluded in their belief that capital punishment does have a strong deterrent effect, and each execution in the country, in their judgment and their views of their study, on average results in 18 fewer murders. So there is academic white paper research to substantiate what I believe that the death penalty does serve as a strong deterrent. I think this is a good discussion this morning. It's a sober discussion as it should be. I think it's altogether proper that we talk about the seriousness of the death penalty as a sanction against the worst of the worst that commit the most heinous crimes against Nebraskans. I think the death penalty is appropriate for certain crimes. And 
you've heard a few people mention statistics and forensic evidence from around the country, but members, I would remind you, and I think this is an important distinction, there's no evidence, no evidence, of botched executions in Nebraska. And I think that certain crimes warrant spending. It's necessary to prosecute first degree murder cases and I would sub submit to you that the state of Nebraska, and I don't, I don't think you've heard Senator Seiler talk about this, Senator Chambers, Senator Coash, or any of the other proponents of this legislation, but yet we've talked about this every time that we've dealt with the death penalty in the past. In our state, and Senator Schumacher would know as one who has uh, served as a county attorney and a prosecutor, if one you minute. look in our statutes, thank you Mr. President, you will find that we have enacted in the past a quite a bit of statute in the area of super due process because of having the death penalty. This legislation doesn't get rid of any of that unless I've missed it. That's an important comp uh, component of this issue. It's been talked about every time that we've talked about a repeal of the death penalty since I've been in the body. I think you're going to hear, as you've heard, other senators talk about why these individuals that are on death row deserve to be there, have been tried in a court, convicted and sentenced to die as justice for their crimes. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator McCoy and Senator Reapy. Senator Snor, you are recognized. Thank you, Mr. President. This is going to go on for a long time, but there's, there's things that got to be said, and uh, there's some things that you're going to hear once again that are not very pleasant. Senator Davis talked about uh, the Beatrice 6, and I, I think it was the Elmwood 2. Uh, I'm not familiar with, any, with those things because I wasn't around with that, when that stuff happened, but we do need to note that none of these people were on death row. So uh, we're talking about death row here. We're talking about the 11 people. That's it. We're not talking about everybody else. We're not talking about what happened in Oklahoma either. This is Nebraska. So those are the, those are the facts we need to stick to. Uh, we talked about justice versus vengeance. And I agree 100%. Uh, we don't need to seek vengeance. It's not our duty. It's, it is our duty to seek justice. And the Bible tells us that from the beginning. It tells us that. Genesis 9, 6 says, Whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed. For in the, in the image of God has God made man. So that's one area. Romans 13. For the governing authority is God's servant to do you good. But if you do wrong, be afraid. For he does not bear the sword for nothing. He is God's servant an agent of wrath for bringing punishment on to the wrongdoer. So we're not seeking vengeance, although it does seem like that at times. And uh, like I said earlier, if, some, if that happened to a member of my family, uh, that's exactly what I would uh, want to do. Whether I'd do it or not, or, I don't know. Senator Koash talked about his son walking across the street and, uh, you know, and the, the difficulty that would be to, to change that, that uh, uh, I guess, thought he had about not being harmed. And, and I can only imagine how he would feel. I, and if that would, something would happen to anybody's family in here, I'd probably be the first in line to help them to seek vengeance. Because uh, it, it is so deplorable, the things that have happened. And this, these happened to adults. They've happened to kids. And we're willing to just uh, let them off. Yeah, they're going to stay in prison forever. Uh, but we've talked about th that there is no money saved here. Uh, because of the, all, there's more appeals from the other uh, folks that are not on death row than the folks that are on death row. There's no money saved. We are not seeking vengeance. We are seeking justice. It's that, that's it. Uh, for those that are unsure and unclear, I just ask you over the weekend to just, uh, just pray, pray hard about what you're gonna do and seek uh, 
seek the power of the Holy Spirit and seek God's word to see what, uh, what it says, what the truth is, because that's where the truth is. That's what we have to use for our baseline. So that's what I'm using. I'm opposed to this. I will continue to speak out against it, and I'll, I'll, do, uh, I'll do the best of my ability to uh, convince others to do so. But uh, this, is not, this is not vengeance. It's, it's justice, and that's how we need to look at it. We need to seek justice for the innocent lives that couldn't seek it for themselves. You know, we've talked uh, a lot over the months about accountability. One minute. So I am uh, I'm willing to go back and tell my constituents that I am willing to hold these people accountable for their actions. So when you're going to think of how you're going to vote, think about that. Are you willing to hold these people accountable? And you're willing to seek justice? Uh, you know, going and and uh, once again, what Senator Koash said about going to that execution and, and seeing that, that uh, I guess, party that would happen, that, that's, a, that's sad. It's sad that we, we as a society do those kind of things that we celebrate that because that would be bad to watch. You know, I, I agree with him 100%. That, that puts a really bad picture in your mind of what is, uh, what is happening. And, and I don't support that at all, but I do support justice. Time, and that's Senator. what we have to look at. Thank you, Senator Schnorr. Senator Groney, you are recognized. Thank you, Mr. President. I stand in opposition to LB2A68. My rationale, my beliefs, as elected officials of a civilized society, our duty is to protect that society from evil. When I look at those individuals on death row, I see evil. When our national government sends our armed forces to foreign lands, they are expected to use debt as a tool to protect civilized society. When we arm our police force, we entrust in them the ability to use judgment, to use deadly force to protect civilized society. When we arm our when we have, we have laws that give individual citizens the right to use deadly force to protect themselves from evil. The death penalty is an extension of our responsibility to protect civilized society and protect the rights of free citizens to feel protected and safe as they live their lives. The term freedom of choice when referring to matters of right to life has a different meaning to me. I believe an unborn child should have a choice to live. He should choose or she should choose that choice. I be believe that an individual when, who knows that a crime they plan to commit holds for them the choice of death for themselves, these evil individuals choose death at the hands of a civilized society. The choice of debt for their actions bears no burden to my Christian conscience. I've stated in an earlier debate that vengeance is expensive. When referring to punishment for crimes of property and personal assault, in those cases rehabilitation is merited. But evil is blinded to truth. It cannot be rehabilitated. I do not believe that the debt penalty purpose is vengeance. It instead is a proper punishment to protect society from evil. We must send a strong message to evil that if you intend to premeditately plan to kill the innocent, that the citizens of Nebraska will not tolerate that evil. It is a deterrent. The legislature today should not be debating LB 268, but instead debating legislation to assure that those on death row have their constitutional right to a speedy trial and the rewards they chose to receive the punishment of death to just rewards of their selfish actions. As much as we would like evil to stay in the dark, it does not. When it re rears its ugly head, we as elected officials have a duty to protect civilized society. No on LB 
268 is the correct decision. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Groney. Members, Senator Sullivan would like to welcome 46 members of the fourth grade class of Pierce Elementary and two teachers. Would you please rise and be recognized by your Nebraska legislature? Welcome. Those in the queue wishing to speak, Senator McCoy, Senator Kittner, Senator Brosh, Brosh Senator Shear, and others. Senator McCoy, you are recognized. Thank you, Mr. President and members. I'd like to remind the body, I don't believe it's been mentioned uh, yet this morning. Uh, this is not an issue that we wrestle with alone in Nebraska. Unless my count is wrong, 32 states still in this great union that we love, our nation, have the death penalty. Added in addition to that is the United States military and the U.S. government. I want to repeat that. 32 states still have the death penalty as the ultimate punishment for crimes committed against their citizens. I want to talk at this time on the microphone about, which also hasn't been mentioned this morning, the legal side of this equation. You know, one of the benefits of having very strong attorneys in this body in the past debating this issue, and when I say that I mean Senators Lautenbach, Senators Flood, and others, Senators White, Lathrop, and others, was that they had a full length and breadth of an understanding and knowledge of the Supreme Court cases regarding the death penalty. I'm going to highlight one that has served to guide not just Nebraska on this issue, but every state in the country. Because if you go back and look, members, and I know many of you probably have, there was a period of time in the 1970s when the death penalty was not used. It had effectively been deemed unconstitutional by the Supreme Court. And then, in 1976, Gregg v. Georgia, in a landmark Supreme Court decision, a plurality and majority of the court found that the death penalty was not a violation of the Eighth Amendment's prohibition against cruel and unusual punishment. And I'm going to read a quote from the court, from the, from the, majority, of the, the majority opinion on that case that has guided this issue ever since across the country. The plurality, the plurality therefore concluded, quote, the infliction of death as a punishment for murder is not without justification and thus is not unconstitutionally severe, end quote. I think this is very important to note that the highest law in the land, our United States Supreme Court, has spoken on this issue a number of times, but most notably in this case. You know, it strikes me that this issue is one that probably reacquaints itself to the majority of, uh, to many Nebraskans, certainly to this legislature from time to time, not necessarily because of Senator Chambers, but because this issue has been one that's been hotly contested for hundreds, if not thousands of years in society. But it's one that's very visceral to many of us. Who can really speak for the victims other than us? One minute. The dead asked for justice. Who speaks for them? We do. Not one individual on death row in Nebraska, members, not one, claims to be innocent.
This is a very important issue, one that deserves debate if it means it's every session. But I am against LB 268. Thank you, Senator McCoy. Senator Kittner, you are recognized. Thank you, Mr. President. You know, I, uh, I thank God he's given me clarity on this. I've not struggled with this one bit. Um, and I'm, and I, you know, I, my district expects me to come down here and support the death penalty. The state expects me to do that. And we, we had that Gallup survey that said 63% of Americans support the death penalty. And I would suspect it's a little higher in our state. We're usually a little more conservative in America at, um, at large. And if you look at this legislature, we have consistently tried to go against the will of the people. Uh, the first one this year was Medicaid expansion. People in this state have spoken clearly that they do not want Obamacare. But there are people here that are going to force it on the people in Nebraska if they like it or not. The people in Nebraska f firmly support the death penalty. That's not even debatable. But there are people in this legislature that want to force it on the people. They're going to force their view of the world on the people they elected them. And I've, I think there'll be a few more times this year before it's over when the, the people in this body are trying to go against the will of the people of our state. People are clearly in favor of the death penalty. Now, I had a now, I had a, we remember we had a senator earlier that tried to say it cost three times as much or something, and we have our attorney general put out the, the, the uh, information and know there's no significant cost difference between somebody on death row and somebody with life imprisonment. We had another senator come up and say small counties don't want to seek the death penalty because it costs so much to prosecute it. Well, that's news because the small county attorneys want the death penalty. If it was so expensive, they wouldn't want it. But part of having a death penalty is they can hold that over somebody and without going to trial, get them to, to plead to life imprisonment with the threat of execution there. So it's actually a tool. So when, when a senator said that, couldn't be more wrong. I'll listen to the county attorneys over an advocate trying to get rid of the death penalty. And finally, I want to go through one case that happened in Sarpy County. This is... Um, John J. Jubert, J. Jubert, Jubert. He lived in Senator Crawford's district. He kidnapped little boys in Senator Garrett's district and in Senator Smith's district and then killed them in Senator Crawford's district. This happened during the 1980s. And uh, this is, I'm going to read it to you. After stalking a young man for quite some time, Jubert grabbed young Danny Joe Eberly, a 13-year-old paper boy, off his bicycle, put his hand over his mouth and a knife to his throat, and told him to come with him and not make any sounds. Jubert ordered Danny to lie down next to the car, where Jubert tied Danny's hands behind his back and then tied his feet together and placed tape over his mouth. Jubert placed the helpless and bound Danny in the trunk of his car, drove to a secluded area, and this is in Senator Crawford's district, and dragged Danny into the cornfield. In that cornfield, Jubert pulled out a knife and ordered Danny to lie on his stomach. He took off his pants while the young man pleaded, please don't kill me. He slowly stabbed Danny, but the wounds were not mortal enough, and then Danny was still alive when uh, Jubert sliced the back of Danny's neck. To make sure he was dead, he sliced a seven-inch inch gap into Danny's leg all the way down to the bone. One minute. 13-year-old boy here. Death was not instantaneous. Danny was aware for three to four minutes while Jubert inflicted nine cuts to the body before succumbing to death from loss of blood. Fewer than three months later, Jubert awoke early in the morning for the purpose of finding another victim. While driving past Pawnee School, Jubert noticed 
Christopher Walden walking to school. Jubert got out of his car, walked toward Christopher, showed him a knife, and ordered Christopher to be quiet or he would kill him. Jubert ordered Christopher to lie down on the floor on the front of the passenger seat where he drove to another isolated spot. This was early December and there was snow on the ground. Jubert ordered Christopher to strip down to his underwear, lie down on his back. Because it was cold, Christopher balked at the command, but Jubert grabbed Christopher by the neck, placed him down on the ground, where he placed his hands to his chest and started strangling him. He couldn't strangle him, so he pulled out a knife. Time, Senator. Thank you. Members, Senator Coulterman would like to welcome 18 students, one teacher from Osceola High School. Would you please rise and be recognized by your Nebraska legislature? Senator Brosh, you are recognized. Thank you, Mr. President, and uh, thank you, colleagues. Um, again, I do rise in opposition, strong opposition, and no joy in what we must do and as for justice. I see there are no children in the balcony, no students. And colleagues, I would like to remind you that we do have children here. When they are in the balcony, we must refrain our dialogue for the short time we're here. Um, there is no law that requires that, but I am so concerned about our visitors here. And I waited. I, I have a lot to say. I have a lot of facts. And I, but I wanted to bring this out, that seeing there are no children here, recently we received an email in our office and we're talking about justice, about sentencing. And I received an email from uh, a Nebraskan that says Senator Brosh, Andrea Kruger's mother attracted a lot of attention, or murder attracted a lot of attention because she was a mother killed by a hardened criminal recently released from prison. This person is very concerned about our justice system because this person's mother had, uh, and again, I'm not, I'm not going to tell you the name of the person she's concerned about. I am not going to tell you the name of this person who sent this email or the district they're from. But they're very concerned because this person um, may be released shortly. And that this person um, at one point had uh, abducted a woman at gunpoint from a vegetable market, brutally raped and beat, beat the person, and then left her in a remote area to die. But she did die. She did not die. This person was sentenced. And uh, while he was sentenced, uh, he did not re uh, return uh, to the facility that he was incarcerated at. And when he got away um, from his work detail, uh, he committed some other crimes. And then at one point, they broke into her home, uh, raped and beat her mother, shot her father three times to murder him, during the attack, he talked about how he was going to rape um, their two daughters, at that time, ages 5 and 10, cut them into little pieces, and uh, leave them for dog food. The only person, the only reason this person was not convicted of uh, murder, it was plea bargained down or attempted murder, and uh, they're soon to be back on the street. So we need to think about evil. People who do commit murder, want to commit murder, try to commit murder, and there are witnesses, there are no mistakes. This is justice. So I do have concerns. I have more to say, but uh, even though uh, Senator Koash and I have a difference, I would like to give him my remaining time here. Senator Koash, you yielded one minute and 10 seconds. Thank you. Will Senator Schnorr yield to a quick question? Senator Schnorr, will you yield to a question? Yes, sir, I will. 
Thank you, Senator Schnorr. Senator Schnorr, do you enjoy barbecue? Do I enjoy barbecues? Yes. For the most part, yes. Bacon? Mm, it's okay. I like beef better. Ham? Nope. Shrimp? Mm, sometimes. Okay. Thank you, Senator Schnorr. Those things are banned in, in the, under the Bible. Not supposed to eat pork. That's what it says in the Bible. And I, I told Senator Schnorr I'd ask him that, but my point is, colleagues, we can find some biblical references to justify our position on either one of these issues, and I think they're all valid, um, but they all need to be taken into the context, and I appreciate the time. Colleagues, the only thing I wanted to, a couple things I want to say is, the reality is, Nebraska's done executing people. We can't get the drugs to do it. Companies won't sell Time, them to Senator. us. Thank you, Mr. President. While the legislature is in session and capable of transacting business, I propose to sign and do hereby sign LR-171, LR-172, LR-173, LR-175, LR-176, and LR-177. Those in the queue are Senators Scheer, Kenhar, Crawford, Reapy, and others. Senator Scheer, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise today, as I did uh, the previous times, in opposition to removing the death penalty. It certainly is a personal uh, conviction that we all have. There probably is no right or wrong answers. There's no right or wrong side on this issue. We all have our own reasons. I've heard some comments that we need to do away with the death penalty simply because it's not a deterrent. Well, I suspect that no crime, the punishment for the crime is a deterrent. We all go in excess of the speed limit. We all know it's against the law. Very few of us would know what the penalty is for however fast we're going. We don't think of that. We just want to get somewhere quicker. If somebody's going to steal a pair of jeans or a sweater from a store, I'm not sure they're thinking about if that's whatever type of felony or misdemeanor or if they're going to be in prison for one year or if they're going to be in the county jail for one day. I don't know that anyone can tell you that any punishment is a deterrent for any crime, let alone the death penalty for a capital uh, offense. We've had some discussion about costs. I don't think justice should have a cost, and it doesn't. Justice is uh, doled out by the state and the government, regardless of the conviction or the crime, none of which is cost effective. If you're caught speeding and you go to jail, or if you go to the court and you end up paying your 42 or your $52, and even if you only spent 15 minutes, the judge's time, the prosecutor's time, the patrolman that picked you up that has to now be there because you're going to have a trial, none of that is cost effective. So for us to assume that capital punishment has to be cost effective, I think is a little hard from a logical standpoint to agree with. No justice is cost effective. If it were, we'd not have any laws because nothing would be cost effective. Now, I do have perhaps a different perspective on the death penalty because Norfolk has had several murders in its history in the last 20, 30 years. Probably the thing that concerns me more than anything is not necessarily the death penalty, but how heinous it has to be in order to be uh, subjected to the death penalty. We've talked about the bank robberies in Norfolk, and certainly they were heinous. 
Seven people were executed, and I'll say executed. I don't know if, if some of those did it for fun, they did it out of spite, or out of fear. But we had another one about 20 years ago, or maybe even 30 years ago, where a gentleman saw a picture of a bride-to-be, went to her trailer, one minute. broke into her trailer, strangled her, sexually molested her. Wasn't sure she was dead, so he filled the bathtub up, drowned her. Still wasn't sure that she was dead, so he took some hose, some pantyhose, put it in her mouth and her throat and took a plunger and forced them down her neck. Now, folks, that wasn't heinous enough to get the death penalty. Is it dispersed fairly? Maybe not. But even if it's not, I still think we should have the availability of that. For those that commit the ultimate crime, ultimate justice should still be available as a, a, a result of that. I don't suspect that I've changed one person's mind. I'm just telling you my mind and how I perceive this in my, my personal perspective. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Senator Ken Hart, you're recognized. Mr. President, members of the body, uh, I'll take more time later on in the discussion, but I do support LB 268. Um, I, I believe personally, and I campaigned against the death penalty, um, and I believe that if we just look at history, I think as we as more and more countries in this world, as we become more and more civilized, we've realized that the death penalty is something that we can and should let go of. Um, and later on, we're having all these horror stories. Uh, I would like to read some things that happened during the Inquisition and the things that happened that, and simply like to say that for the uh, Old Testament Christians who who quote an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth should not be should not be uh, too offended by the stoning that happened of a woman committing adultery uh, in the Middle East because that was also condoned in the Old Testament. I'd like to give the rest of my time to Senator Crawford. Senator Crawford you yielded three minutes and forty seconds. Thank you, Mr. President. I rise in support of LB 268. I think many of the supporters of LB 268 have already eloquently outlined key arguments. I just feel compelled, colleagues, to share a personal story with you um, of Dr. Ashley Gage because she shared this story with me yesterday and asked me to share it with you. Um, Dr. Ashley Gage was here yesterday um, because it was Social Work Day. She is a professor of social work at UNK. When she was 18 years old, um, her father was murdered. She found him murdered in the front yard and tried to perform CPR, called 911. She talked about how traumatized she was by having that 911 tape played over and over again in news coverage of her father's death. She shared with me how grateful she is that the murderer in this case was convicted to life without parole because she was able to have closure. She had to go through the trauma of the news coverage and the trauma of the trial once and only once. So that happened, it was very traumatic, but she was able to go through it and then be able to get over it, which unfortunately many other cases that has not been the case and when it is a, a death penalty trial. And so she was able to get counseling at school and be able to move on, get her master's degree, get her PhD, and now is able to teach and teach our future social workers. And that, she said, is because she was able to have closure, because in her case, the murderer was convicted to um, life without parole. And now she says whenever she has a bad dream or gets a panic attack, all she has to do is check Check online, she sees the murderer still behind bars. Her confidence is restored and she has closure. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Crawford. And Senator Crawford, you wave. Thank you. Senator Reapy, you're recognized. Mr. President, fellow senators and Nebraskans, 
I will now tell the story of a Nebraska brutal murder. Uh, individuals in this chamber or visitors who do not have a stomach for gruesome details may want to excuse themselves. And I also ask that if there are any young children either in the chamber or watching on television that, uh, that they mute the screen at home or leave the chamber, please. The case I'm about to share with you happened in Scotts Bluff. The name of the heinous murderer I will not dignify with its use, but this murderer now sits on Nebraska's death row. The wicked and gruesome murder circumstances are of a three-year-old boy, a three-year-old innocent little boy, whose skull was crushed twice and decapitated. The boy's little body was cut into pieces. A part of the boy's bone was found in a dog's digestive tract based on an autopsy performed on the dog. The little three-year-old boy was fed to the dog. Parts of the boy's little body were found in the sewer line. Some had been boiled, some found in a freezer, and some in the dog's food dish. The three-year-old boy, twice, his twice crushed skull was found in a crawl space in this heinous murderer's basement. Yes, he retained the skull to prove he had killed the little boy, a trophy. And the little boy's skull had been gnawed on by a dog. A three-judge panel found this brutal murder demonstrated exceptional depravity of a degree unseen with aggravating circumstances required for a death sentence. The judges wrote this heinous murder showed corruption, evil, and malviolence seldom found in a human condition. Some will say the cost of appeal is greater than the cost of its life sentence. This is not relevant. This is not about money. This is about the right to live among us. In the end, the taxpayers will pay either way. Some will say life imprisonment without parole is the way to go. I don't buy that argument. We will see the same kind of post-conviction litigation on a life sentence. Some could argue a life sentence without parole is cruel and unusual punishment. And I repeat, some will argue that a life sentence is now cruel and unusual punishment. My fellow legislators and citizens of Nebraska, this little boy for sure deserved better. You and I deserve better. We deserve to not have this and like heinous murders among us. We do deserve better. We need to protect the innocent and we need to rid ourselves of the evil, the evil who are guilty of heinous murders. Retain the death penalty and vote no on LB 268. If I have any time left, I would yield that to uh, Senator McCoy if you'd like. Senator McCoy, 140. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, uh, Senator Reepy. You know, one of the things that's, uh, that I think Senator Reepy just mentioned that I think bears repeating, that there is no evidence under LB 268, either with AM 754, the committee amendment, or the green copy of the bill alone, that the anguish and the toll on victims' families that you hear supporters of LB 268 talk about with a continued death penalty are going to go away. The appeals process doesn't change. One minute. I think that's an important factor to, to talk about. I'll say it, uh, I'll say it again, and I, it's not something I relish or any of us relish to stand up here and talk about the heinous crimes that the individuals on death row have committed. Or in Senator Scheer's case, talking about a case of someone who's not on death row who may should, who possibly should be, who didn't receive the death penalty for that crime. But it's something that has to be done because if we don't do it, members, who will? Who is going to talk about these heinous crimes? Who is going to talk about the loss of life? Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator McCoy.
Those still wishing to speak, Senator Garrett, Craighead, Brash, Schnorr, and Johnson. Senator Garrett, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. President. Today I rise as a conservative opponent to the death penalty, not for the sake of the convicted, but for the sake of society. While it may be true that the death penalty is a wasteful, inefficient use of taxpayer dollars, my main objections come from my pro-life values. I believe the state of Nebraska giving itself the power to play God is an affront to my efforts and the efforts of my conservative brethren to create a culture of life in society. For 26 years, I served my country in the Air Force. I've seen life taken and implore my fellow senators not to trivialize human life. There's too much life taken from this world on a daily basis, and we do not have to join in the mob of destruction. What gives this state the power to decide when its citizens will live or when, will, when, when they will die? How can the state know if an individual is finished with a spiritual growth? I recall the story of a man from the town of Tarsus named Saul. Saul went from town to town killing Christian men, women, and children in defense of the Jewish faith. He saw the light quite literally, changed his name to Paul, and dedicated his life to Jesus Christ, writing over half of the New Testament in the process. Paul is proof that it is never too late for someone to find redemption. It is never too late for an individual to spiritually grow and leave the world a better place than he found it. I may be old-fashioned, but I believe God should be the only one who decides when it's time to call a person home. The state has no business playing God. In fact, we are quite bad at it. We let politics, the news cycle, and other factors get in the way. Society enters into a mob mentality, and we many times sentence innocent people to death. Last week, Anthony Ray Hinton, an innocent man who spent 30 years on death row, was finally set free. Oh, by the way, he's got cancer on top of everything else. Like Ray Crone, he was found guilty by the mob when the evidence clearly showed his innocence. I believe in the sanctity of life. I believe that life begins at conception and should be protected until God calls the individual home. Let us join together as a legislature to pr promote a culture of life. If we work together, we can create a culture of life that seeps through society and makes the world a better place for our children. I heard a comment earlier that uh, 32 states still permit the death penalty. We are the n only nation in, in the Americas that still has a death penalty. There are more than 140 nations worldwide who have abandoned capital punishment. And in the world today, we are number five in the number of executions behind China, Iran, Iraq, and uh, Saudi Arabia. Colleagues, we can do better than that. We have to do better than that. I'd like to quote something from Charles Krauthammer, someone I greatly admire. One is not supposed to talk these days about higher and lower levels of civilization, but even political correctness would admit that the idea of, of would admit that the less a society has recourse to official violence, the more civilized it is. We do not cut off the hands of thieves. We do not kill haul miscreant sailors. We no longer have public floggings. Each ab each ab abolition represents an advance of civilization. Abolition of the death penalty represents a further advance. But there's, there's, there's no convincing evidence that the death penalty de deters. Murder rates in states with a death penalty are just as high as in neighboring states without it. When something as barbaric as cold-blooded execution by the state makes no appreciable contribution to public safety, it deserves abolition. But on balance, it seems to me worth foregoing the satisfaction of perfect justice, as all of Western Europe has done, to live in a society, a society civilized enough to maintain order without judicial killing. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Senator Garrett. Colleague Senator Kittner would like to recognize 16 fourth grade students from St. John the Baptist Elementary and one teacher. They're from Plattsmouth. They are seated in the north balcony. Could you please rise and be recognized by your Nebraska legislature? Senator Craighead, you are recognized. Thank you, Mr. President. I and yield I'm my sorry, time. This is, your, this is your third time. Thank you. I yield my time to Senator Kintner. Senator Kintner, you yielded 453. Well, thank you, Mr. President. You know, we're, we're going to talk about this for a while. Let there be no misunderstanding. It's my intention to stop this bill from passing. Uh, we'll have a long discussion on justice, the costs, the rights of government protecting us life and the heinous crimes of those people who've committed these things in Nebraska. I've, uh, you know, I've listened quite a bit, and uh, when I hear a colleague say that we're playing God, 
No, we're not. God has given us government to organize our lives. And God's given the government the sword. Scripture indicates that uh, murder defiles a land, defiles a nation. It brings God judgment unless murder, murderers are executed. You know, if we want God's blessings on this nation, we need to take the issue of the death penalty very seriously. We're not playing God. We're doing exactly as God has asked us to do in this. And... Um, I would submit to you that we're the only Western country that still executes people because we're the only country that still has some vestiges left of Christianity. Europe has pretty much moved from God. Less than 10% of the people in Europe even go to church. And we're the last country where still 40 to 50% go to church every Sunday. And it's uh, the fact that we still have laws based upon our Christian heritage and values as that fades away, I might add, but we still have that. And as we, you know, we may get to some point in the future where we get to only 10, 20% go to church, and I'm sure we'll have the death penalty gone by that time. But not right now. I'm here to stop the progressive vision of Nebraska that does not have a death penalty, that wants Obamacare, and wants a whole host of other things that our state doesn't want, but that the majority of this body wants, and I'm here to stop it. You know, I was talking about uh, John Jubert, and we we're talking about at the point I left off, he had just uh, kidnapped his second uh, child. He was strangling him. And uh, he decided to stab this young man. The young man was about 12 years old. Young Christopher was his name. He stabbed him a couple of times in the back and then sliced his throat just to make sure he was dead. He carefully and deliberately carved his body's stomach up in the representation of a plant with a stem and seven leaves. Christopher did not die instantly. This young boy lived with those wounds for several minutes, but was stabbed 15 more times, and he gradually lapsed into a coma and died. Now, we know this because John Jobert admitted it. There's no question about what he did. And he was executed July 17th, 1996. The people that we uh, have on death row are people Whereas an eyewitness saw them do it, are they admitted to doing it? We are not matching fingerprints to a murder weapon, and they were in the area at the time. To get the death penalty now, there pretty much has to be an eyewitness or a confession. One minute. And that's the way it should be. Actually, the Bible says there needs to be two eyewitnesses. And by the way, I don't think that would be a bad law to have two eyewitnesses before we admit uh, gave someone a death penalty. We're going to talk about this a little more, and I'm sure there'll be some more claims of cost and all camp stuff by, by the opponents. But as I said earlier, there will not be a claim of innocence for any of the 11 people on death row or any of the 33 people, or at least the 11 that we've uh, put to death in the last 30 years. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Kittner and Senator Craighead. Senator Brasha, recognize, and this is your third time. Thank you, Mr. President, and thank you, colleagues. I do appreciate the opportunity to speak up in opposition on LB 268 and also respond to uh, Senator Garrett's comments earlier when he calls us out to look at internationally. This was not on my radar, I'll have to admit, but yes, we have long lines of immigrants waiting to come here into our country. Those who are escaping political situations, wanting asylum here, women internationally whose social cultures and norms are harmful and horrific. Don't compare us to other international 
places. My parents, they said, my uncle had a radio in his dorm room. They found it. He didn't get any kind of trial or jury or punishment. They just shot him when they found the radio. That's the kind of justice they have internationally. They don't need, interne they don't need capital punishment. They may be trigger happy right off the get-go. So please, we are the envy for our freedoms, for our justice, for our system. But it is good to look at what others are doing, other states, when we do write public policy, and to look what the data is in other states, and actually look at our data and our numbers in our state, because from the report of the Department of Corrections, there is no disproportionate execution of min minorities on death row. In fact, white versus other minorities, the whites are executed at a higher percentage. When you run the total numbers, 30% of whites total to a 30% of the minorities. And that number can be found on the Department of Corrections. The state of Nebraska is fair, is just, and is very careful, and more careful with every generation moving forward in execution. Granted, we are at a standstill because of the method, but that does not deter the need for justice for the victims, their families, who live in terror and horror and heartache and are living through excruciating pain following an unnatural, cruel, evil terror that they have experienced. Not only does the victim die, but their family. This response is taken very seriously. There is no joy, but there is a somber duty of justice. And we have very high standards in this process. Thank you, Mr. President, and thank you, colleagues. Thank you, Senator Brosh. Senator Schnorr, you're recognized, and this is your third time. Thank you, Mr. President. Well, the debate continues. Uh, I'd like to uh, talk about those that are in support of the death penalty. You know, currently, historically, you know, in our government, our current uh, Attorney General, Doug Peterson, is in support of the death penalty. And he says, I do believe the death penalty could be a deterrent to an individual committing a crime. However, I believe the death penalty's primary purpose is to serve as a measured punishment based upon heinous capital acts. Doug Klein, I, I, I think I pronounced that correctly, he's a Douglas County attorney. Uh, he also represents the Nebraska County Attorneys Association. He says, and I quote, in certain extreme unique situations, we believe there needs to be the death penalty, end quote. Our former governor, Dave Heineman, says, and I quote, Nebraska needs a legal means of execution. There is broad support for the death penalty in our state, end quote. Former Speaker of the House, Mike Flood, once said, quote, I firmly believe that the death penalty remains appropriate in those circumstances involving the most heinous of crimes, and I expect a thorough and deliberate debate, end quote. John Bruning, our former Nebraska Attorney General, says this, I quote, Nebraskans believe that death is the appropriate sentence for those who commit the most horrific murders. Those who commit the ultimate crime deserve the ultimate punishment." End quote. Hal Dobb, he was a former U.S. Congressman, former Omaha mayor, and now the univers excuse me, University of Nebraska Board of Regents. 
member. He says this, and I quote, I am convinced that the death penalty is an important deterrent to those who commit intentional murder. They should know that society exacts them from the same result that exacted from their intentional provocation and killing. The death penalty is an important marker in a society that expects people to conduct themselves in an appropriate way. I am strongly opposed to the repeal of the death penalty for moral and societal reasons. Those are uh, our uh, former and current leaders. Also, remember, we as a uh, democratic republic have voted Governor Pete Ricketts in office. He also supports the death penalty and stands against this repeal. So the leadership above us uh, supports this and we're trying to, trying to overthrow it. You know, I know we're a, uh, a separate part of the system. We don't answer directly to those. But let's keep in mind, that's, that's who we voted into office. We talked, uh, one obviously, we... One minute, thank you, sir. We've talked a lot about Christianity. Uh, when Tommy Garrett, or excuse me, Senator Garrett, talked about uh, what Saul did, he's absolutely right. Anybody can change. Uh, it's, uh, you can be, uh, you know, it's amazing. Saul, who uh, then became Paul, became a disciple, and he was a murderer. So that just shows how things can happen. Uh, I'll be running out of time here, but I do have answers for Senator Har about my Old Testament Christianity. So uh, I will, uh, if I get time later, I will answer to those as well. So like I say, we've talked a lot about accountability, holding these people accountable for their actions. Uh, you know, we didn't commit the crimes, they did. Let's continue with our justice. Let's let uh, our elected representatives. Time, thank you, sir. Time, Senator. Thank you. Seeing no one else in the queue, Senator Chambers, I'm sorry, Senator Hittner, you recognize the close on AM 990 to AM 754. Well, thank you, Mr. President. I think we've uh, covered some ground here. I think we've gotten people a chance to kind of stake out their claim as to where they stand. And I think that's a, a good thing. And it's just kind of go through where we've been here. We've talked about the people, um, we've talked about some of the people on death row who had been executed, they were on death row, they'd been executed, and some of, the, some of the heinous things that they've done. We've talked about the 11 people on death row, and we'll talk about them more later, but we've talked about the 11 people, uh, no disputing their innocence at all. Uh, we've talked about the cost, and uh, people have tried to claim that it costs more to keep someone on death row than, uh, than it does to keep them in life imprisonment. And uh, we found out that that's, according to our Attorney General, that doesn't hold any water at all in the state of Nebraska. We can't talk about the other states, but we can talk about Nebraska. And, and the cost difference between putting someone on death row and putting someone on life in, in imprisonment is, uh, there, there's no real, real discernible difference. We've talked about the, the, the county attorney. Someone claimed that the rural counties uh, don't want to, to prosecute this, but the rural county attorneys want this. And they use it as a tool. And quite often, they can get someone to plead with the threat of a death penalty where they won't even have to go and, uh, and run the cost of a trial. So it actually saves small counties money. 
And, uh, you know, we, we've also talked uh, a little about uh, what someone said, racial disparity, and we're going to have a little more on that, but we've actually done a study in our state, at least it was done about 15 years, 14 years ago, and we'll, uh, and we'll find out in a little bit here that there, there's no racial disparity at all in how our sins are carried out in our state. And I'm proud to say that, that I live in a state where we don't have those racial disparities. So that, uh, Mr. President, I'd like to... Uh, uh, withdraw this amendment. Seeing no objection, it's withdrawn. Mr. President, uh, Senator Kittner would move to amend with AM 991. Senator Kittner, you recognize the open on your amendment. Well, thank you, Mr. President. Now, what this does is it strikes uh, section 6, page 5 of AM 754. It strikes the section that gets rid of the class one felony, which is, um, strike, excuse me, strikes the intent, intent language on page 20, not page five. Um, that current inmates on death row should have uh, their penalties. I would um, also like to talk is, uh, that's what, what it does. We'd like to walk through the people who are actually on death row. And, we, and we've talked about a couple of them. I think Senator Reapy did an excellent job in talking about one of them. But let's, let's go through them. We've got Casey Dean Moore, first degree murder on two counts. The, uh, this was 1980, he murdered two cab drivers in the course of two separate robberies. The next one is from 1986, Michael Ryan. First degree murder. The torture murder of a cult member previously murdered five-year-old son of another cult member. 1996, John Lauder, first degree murder, three counts. That's Richardson County. Triple murder of a prior sexual assault victim. And two innocent bystanders who happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. There's the one that uh, Senator Reapy so elegantly talked about, Raymond Mata from 2000. Murdered and dismembered a three-year-old boy. First degree murder and kidnapping. Next, we have uh, from 2001, Arthur Gales, first degree murder, two counts, attempted second degree murder, double murder, rape, and murder of a 13 year old girl, murder of her seven year old brother. Next, we have uh, 2004, another first degree m murder, guy's name is Galindo. Jorge Glendo murdered five people in the attempted ro robbery of the Norfolk Bank. I think that was mentioned earlier today, too. And you wonder why every senator from Norfolk is strongly for the death penalty. Next thing is 2005, Jose Sandovi, Sandoval, first to re-murder five counts, Madison County. He was part of the, uh, the Norfolk bank robbery. Next we get to um, Jeffrey Hessler from 2005, first degree murder, that was Scott's Bluff. Every senator we've ever had from Scott's Bluff knows that case very well. Kidnap, rape, murder of a 15 year old girl. Next we have Eric Vela, 2007, first degree murder, Madison County, murdered five people in the attempted robbery of the Norfolk Bank. I've only got two more to go. 2009, Roy Ellis, first degree murder, Douglas County, abduction and murder of a 12 year old girl. The last one was from 2010, Marco Torres, Hall County, First degree murder, it was a double murder. These 
people are bad people. Let me tell you where it stands right now. Two of these people are out of appeals. They're ready to be executed. I know the Attorney General has been working on it. I would expect that uh, they will request death certificates for these two, I would think probably before the summer's out. And the rest of these people are still in, in, in their appeals process. It is important if we're going to have a death penalty that we use it, and I think that our Attorney General understands that, and he's moving forward with this. And I, I appreciate his hard work. And um, I want to thank the governor. I want to thank the Attorney General. They were both in Omaha about two hours ago. They had a press conference with, with the mayor of Omaha, the police chief, several county attorneys, including, including one of mine in my district. And they went to Omaha and they had a press conference and they said, this is important. Don't let the legislature take this away. Law enforcement wants this as a tool. And I'll tell you what, I want them to do their job. I want to give them what they need to correctly do their job. And I think we should all want that. And I would encourage you to support my amendment and let's uh, put to 68 to bed like the people of our state want us to do. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Kittner. You heard the opening on AM 991. Those wishing to speak, Senator McCoy and Senator Schnorr. Senator McCoy, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. President and members. Would Senator Seiler yield, please? Senator Seiler. Sorry, Senator McCoy, I don't see him. All right. Um, would Senator Coash yield, please? Senator Coash, would you yield for a question, please? Yes, I will. Thank you, Senator Coash. In lieu of Senator Seiler being here, I wanted to ask you a couple questions, actually, about the underlying committee amendment, AM 754. Uh, particularly, um, I'll give you a moment if you need it to, uh, to find this. Uh, I'm looking at page 20, uh, section 23, which starts on line 25 and culminates in line 28. And I have a specific question because I went back and looked, and um, unless I'm mistaken, and to the previous legislation, I can't recall off the top of my head what the bill number was two years ago, Senator Chambers' bill on the death penalty. And you'll notice that uh, Section 23 says, is the intent of the legislature that any criminal proceeding in which the death penalty has been imposed but not carried out prior to the effective date of this act, such penalties shall be changed to life imprisonment. Now, I went back and did a quick analysis, unless I've missed uh, my, uh, the boat here, I don't believe that I have. In the past, this legislation, repeal the death penalty legislation, has been written, in this case, to say, shall be changed to life imprisonment without possibility of parole. Why, why was this written to say life imprisonment? Senator Koash. Well, Senator McCoy, um, and I don't have the amendment in front of you, but I am looking at the, uh, the committee statement. The language is in the committee, but that's what I'm saying. I, I'm looking at the committee amendment, and I don't see that in the committee amendment. I understand that might be what the committee statement intended the committee amendment to say, but unless I've missed it, I don't believe that's actually what the committee amendment says. Senator McCoy, I'll be glad to, to double check with that and get back to you on it. I, I would comment on one, one piece of that, though. Um, it was important that the, the statement without the possibility of parole be part of the, the language because we don't want any, any question that if this bill goes through that somebody convicted under this would never, ever be considered for parole. But I will look at that and I've I promise you, I'll, I'll come back on the mic and I'll give you an answer on the record. Well, I, I, and I appreciate that, and I'm actually uh, it, looking. Um,
because I, I, I want to make very clear that, that this, the reason I'm, I'm troubled by this is, if you notice what I first said, is the intent of the legislature. This, this is intent language. So actually, members, if you look at the nuts and bolts of this committee amendment, we don't specify, and I say we loosely, meaning the, the legislature, in this case specifically the Judiciary Committee, hasn't called this out to say life in prison without possibility of parole. That's greatly troubling. Not only am I greatly troubled by the overarching bill, which I oppose strenuously, I'm opposed by the direction that we're going with this committee amendment because it doesn't even codify what's been talked about here on the floor. One minute. And other times on the microphone, I'm going to talk about how I think that and it's my view, in addition to what I just mentioned, which I'll give Senator Coash the opportunity with legal counsel from the committee to look at, um, but I'll finish this time on the microphone in saying that we actually have individuals, David Dunster's a great example, who committed multiple murders while already serving a life sentence for murder. So where, members, is the justice in that? if the death penalty is taken away. And I'll talk about that in further times in the microphone. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator McCoy and Senator Koash. Senator Schnorr, you recognized? Thank you, Mr. I guess it would be better if I use the microphone. Thank you, Mr. President. We've talked about, you know, all of our uh, present and past colleagues, our elected representatives uh, that are in favor of the death penalty and against the abolishment. We talk a lot here about the changes uh, in administration, I guess, if you will, throughout different areas uh, that uh, are within the government. You know, Health and Human Services, Department of Corrections, just to name a few. We talk about how uh, let's give them a chance to uh, make some changes in uh, what they have been charged with. And then uh, we also have a, a new governor in place, a new attorney general. Let's give them a chance to make some changes and, and fix, you know, what is a... Uh, uh, what needs to be fixed with, with how the death penalty is carried out. You know, we can't deny that, that there is a, uh, a flaw in that, in that system that needs to be changed. But let's give them a chance before making this sweeping legislation to take that authority away from them, because that's exactly what we're doing. We're taking the authority away from them, because we, I guess we feel they know better, or that we know better. You know, are we within the power to do that? We sure are. Uh, that's, uh, that's what's given to us. You know, in answer to a few things that were brought up earlier, uh, Senator Koash talked about uh, all the examples in the Bible that we can use, and, uh, and I agree with them. And that is a great thing. Uh, something that was written 2,000 years ago, we can open that and we can refer to that today, and it still is something that... Uh, we can use to change our lives and make it better. So he is 100% right, and I agree with him completely. Uh, Senator Garrett said the same thing about how people can change, and he is absolutely right. We can all change. Uh, so none of us are perfect. Our system's not perfect. Uh, we're, that's because we're imperfect people. It's never going to be perfect, but... Uh, if you don't like our system, you need to go see some other systems around the world uh, where these things that were done by uh, this, this uh, Ryan guy, that's what, uh, that's what leaders used to do in other countries to people that didn't follow the rules. 
So that's the, you know, there's, uh, we talk about the lack of injustice. Well, those are the things that happen in other countries. So let's be extreme, extremely blessed and thankful for what we have because uh, uh, we're the only place in the world like this. But let's not take those tools away uh, from, from those that need it to help uphold the law. Senator Har talked about uh, Old Testament Christianity. One minute. I guess I'd never heard that. And I would say if you're an Old Testament Christian, that probably makes you Jewish, since that's what they believe in the Old Testament. They don't believe that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. He died on the cross, save us from our sins. That's what I believe, so I guess I call myself a New Testament Christian. to give our, our leaders You are recognized. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, good, still morning, colleagues. Sarah McCoy, if, if and I had erroneously stated that the amendment. that that is in there. There was a Supreme Court case, and I'm going to find, it's going to take me a little longer to find that, but there was a Supreme Court case that said if you put in life without the possibility of parole, you usurp the governor's and the pardons board's ability in a practical sense you cannot be paroled to a term of years. When you are convicted of a capital crime, a 1A felony, and under this bill and the amendment, you get life imprisonment, which does not have a term of years. It says you will serve no less than life, and I guess no more than life. And by having that as the sentence, you don't have a term of years. Therefore, the parole board can't say, well, you've served half your life, because we don't know when that is. So at the end of the day, they will never be called in front of the parole board because they don't have a term of years. And I want to say again, the reason that we don't see life without the possibility of parole is because that usurps the pardons boards, which is the governor, the attorney general, and the secretary of state, usurps their ability to commute a sentence. I hope that answers the question. I want to make sure that's on the record. Since I do have some time here, I am going to mention a few things. Colleagues, we're not going to use the death penalty anymore in this state. The drug companies who would sell us these drugs have decided not to do so. We could go the route of other states and start making our own. I don't see that happening. I don't want to talk about, we've, we've had some talks about the appeals process. And I, here's my comment on that. I've been on the judiciary now seven years. 
And not once has a member ever brought a bill that said, you know what, I'm sick of these appeals. Here's a bill to get rid of them so we can execute people more quickly. Not once has that bill been brought in my time. I'll let Senator Chambers talk about his experience. He's been on that committee a lot longer than I have. But there's a reason that senators don't bring those bills. We had four years without Senator Chambers. That would have been a perfect time to have those bills brought and to say, you know what, we're going to reduce these appeals. But we didn't do that. Because it would be suspect. And ultimately, I don't think would be found lawful under a court. One minute. We had, a, in my time here, probably uh, as a body, maybe the most adamant supporters of the death penalty that has occurred in, in a number of years, and they all had their reasons for that. But they didn't bring that bill either. So just keep that in mind. The deterrence effect, I just I want to mention for a minute. Texas puts people to death frequently. And their murder rate has not done, gone down in any measure as a result of the number of people they decide to put to death. Come on, these are criminals. You really think they're thinking ahead? Really think that they're doing the... We've had plenty of examples of the heinous things that have happened. Do you think somebody who could do those things is capable of thinking ahead enough to say, you know what, maybe if I do that, I'll, I'll get the death penalty and I'll change my mind? Time, Senator. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Koash. Colleague Senator Shoemaker would like to welcome 25 fourth graders from St. Bonaventure in Columbus along with one teacher. They are seated in the north balcony. Could you all please rise and be recognized by your Nebraska legislature? Thanks for visiting. Those still wishing to speak, Senator Kittner, Groney, Shear, Chambers, Garrett, and others. Senator Kittner, you are recognized. Thank you, Mr. President. You know, uh, we had a senator earlier talk about racial disparities, and uh, I guess by the time she was done talking, it sounded like that we're uh, grossly unfair to people who aren't, who are of any kind of minority. So, going back and looking at what's been done on this, is the legislature actually in 2001 commissioned a study. I'm holding it in my hand, right here. And they wanted to look at disposition of Nebraska capital and non-capital homicide cases from 7399, illegal empirical analysis authorized by this legislature. And, and they wanted to, uh, it says, I'm reading, research was undertaken pursuant to a decision by the Nebraska legislature to support a study of Nebraska's homicides with a focus on fairness. The principal focus of the report is on decision making between uh, 73 and 99 in 175 death eligible homicides that resulted in 185 prosecutions and 29 death sentences. I've got it right here. What they found out was that it did not have a racial disparity that for the most part it, it was applied evenly to everybody and uh, that's the only study that we've had in our state that actually deals with this but for someone to come up and say this is unfair that uh, it's not applied evenly well we don't have that information the best we have is what the legislature legislature came up with and I'm holding it in my hand and anyone who wants to look at it is free to look at it. Now we, we've talked about a few few cases here and I, I want to go through a few more cases because this, this stuff is just um, absolutely beyond what, what anyone would uh, want to talk about at, at a dinner table. 
Let's go back to 1979. I'm, I'm a high school student. Um, Harold Lamont Ote uh, was sentenced to death after he was convicted of first degree murder in the perpetuation of a sexual assault in the first degree. While walking home in the Axarban Ray, from the Axarban racetrack after drinking with friends late in the night, Ode looked through a victim's house and noticed her sleeping on the sofa. Ode entered the home, stole a stereo, carried it outside, re-entered the home, and where she confronted him, and he said, I'm going to rob you. She had no money, so he said he was going to rape her. He knocked the victim on the couch, pulled out an 11-inch knife, and with a three inch, three quarter inch blade, cut the victim's forehead just to show her he wasn't kidding. After cutting the forehead, he took the victim downstairs where he proceeded to sexually assault her. Thereafter, he forced the victim to walk back upstairs, get money from her purse, he took the money. He then started to stab the victim who pleaded for him to not kill her. She pleaded for mercy. He stabbed her at least 15 times, but she was still alive. He then took a hammer from the top of the victim's dresser, hit the victim on the head four or five times, but he was still not sure she was dead. He then took the victim's own belt and strangled her. The victim was found to have died a substantial period of time after the initial stabbing. One minute. He covered the victim's face after he killed her. In response to the inquiry why he covered her face, he said, I couldn't stand the site. He was put to death September 2nd, 1994. Remember that name. Harold Lamont Willie Ote. And Mr. President, I will, I'll be back with a few more. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Kutney. Senator Groney, you recognize? Thank you, Mr. President. I'm a fiscal conservative, but money isn't a factor in this debate. How do you put a price on protecting the innocent from evil? If a price cost is your concern, then let's fix the debt penalty. Let's fix the repeal process. Let's give the convict who chose his fate by doing the act that he chose to do, let's give him a quick trial. Let's put it into, let's give him what he wishes. Let's give him his just reward. That could be done in this body, and those who have talked about financial concerns, I'm sure will support any effort, maybe next year to, through the judiciary system, now that we're going to have the prisons all uh, fixed up. If this is a concern and a financial strain, then let's fix it. I reiterate, those on death row choose to be there. It'd be the easy route to say and look the other way and say, well, I'm, I'm not, I'm above that and uh, I don't think we need to punish them because I don't want to be part of that. Well, that's fine. But some of us have to stand forward and say, we have to protect the innocent from evil. And the death penalty does that. It sends a message that we do not tolerate certain behaviors in our society. That for the greater good, we remove that evil from society. How does the victim's family know that when somebody 20 years old gets put on death row or, or in prison for life, that 50 years later, another generation, when we're gone, most of us, the lifespans ahead of us, then another generation of legislators come in here and say, well, let's, we don't have the memory of what happened, how he heinous that crime was. We got a prison problem. Let's release these guys. They're 70 years old. Evil don't follow ages, folks. You don't get better with life. You don't become a better person some, because you age. What's to stop that fellow generation of legislators say, we got a problem, it's costly to keep these guys in jail. Let's let them out. That was a long time ago. 
How can we assure the families that this won't happen? There's only one way to do that, folks. Take the responsibility of this generation. This generation takes care of the evil amongst us and we remove it from us. There's nothing unchristian or biblical against the death penalty. Our days are numbers. And when you're a criminal, creates a crime, you have numbered your days. That warrants the death penalty. They have chosen to do that. Not I. They have chosen to put themselves on death row. I yield any time I have remaining to Senator Kittner. Senator Kittner, one minute and 30 seconds. Thank you, you um, Senator Groney, for that. I appreciate it. I wanted to start walking through what the death penalty process is. I'm not sure we're going to have enough time to get through it. But there, there, there is a process after death sentence by district court for first degree murder. And it, it's pretty um, lengthy. And we, I want to go through it. And I'll tell you, well, I'll go through it the next time that I come to the mic and kind of walk through. We went through the appeals process earlier. I want to go through exactly what happens in our uh, district court here in Nebraska for first degree murder. murder. And we'll do that in a little bit. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Kittner. Senator Scheer, you are recognized. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, could I ask if Senator uh, Chambers could yield for a uh, a question or two, please. Senator Chambers, will you yield? Yes. Uh, thank you, Senator Chambers. Um, I'm, I'm looking at information. I think perhaps you and Senator Bloomfield might have just discussed this. Prefacing again, I'm not an attorney, so I'm just trying to figure out exactly what I'm looking at. Uh, in the information that you handed out this morning, you had the total number of sentenced to death, and then you went total numbers, and then you broke it down by races. Um, in each one of those, there was an area of commuted. What, what, what does that mean when you're looking at the total number um, sentenced to death is 72 from 03 to 10, and then executed, and then by that whatever method, and then the next item is commuted. Can you explain what that would be, please? The term commuted means that the death penalty, the death sentence is done away with. The conviction remains, the person remains locked up, but is not facing the death penalty. So generally, the full term would be commuted to a term of years or to life. But it doesn't mean they are released. Then if, they, if by commuted, if they are switched to a year term, would it be possible then for them to serve that term through whatever mechanism of times served versus, and again, I'm not. Well, when a person has the death sentence and that is commuted, it is changed to life, not a term of years, life. And the only way that that life sentence can be changed to a term of years is if the pardons board does so. And the pardons board, pursuant to the power given to it under the Constitution could let somebody write off death row out completely. But before a person could ever be considered for parole even, the pardons board would have to meet and change that life sentence to a term of years. Then whatever that term of years would be, would be subject to the way the law says parole should be determined. For example, if it was commuted to 100 years, that in effect means that person is never going to get out of prison. So, so could the parole board commute everyone that would have a, um, a the parole death board, sentence? The parole board has no power to commute a sentence. The only entity that can commute a sentence, that means you forgive, mm -hmm. you lessen it, you reduce it, is the pardons board. I, I'm sorry, I, I meant the pardons board. So oh, the, ask the, me again then. I, 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 I apologize again. Well, maybe this will make it clear. In other states, the governor has full power 
to grant pardons. So the governor can determine whether the person is pardoned in the sense of being released. The sentence will be mitigated, changed from death to life, or changed to a term of years. That's all up to whoever has the power of commutation. The legislature cannot do that. It's why a law that would abolish the death penalty could not be applied retroactively to change the death sentence of people who are on death row. There simply wouldn't be any way to carry out that sentence, but the abolition of the death penalty, and there's an article in there dealing with Maryland where their general assembly abolished the death penalty, but it left five people still on death row. Okay. and our, our are you familiar? One enough? minute. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, or Mr. President. Um, of those that were commuted, were those 31, were they commuted to life sentences or to years sentences? I have no way of knowing. If they were a long time ago, I don't even know. You might would have to go to the Historical Society and see if there are documents that you could look at to get answers to that question. But there might be an underlying question you want to ask me that I don't know whether you're asking me. Are you really trying to ask me, do they get released? No, no, not at oh, all, sir. Okay. No, I was just trying to figure out how the process worked. And I, I've heard terminology, but I'm not necessarily sure that my interpretation of it would be correct. So I wanted just to make sure that I understood what these terminolo terms were meaning in itself. Okay, and if I didn't answer it next time, you can pin me down No, more. I appreciate it so much. Thank you, Mr. Uh, okay. spe uh, S Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Chambers. Thank you, Senator Scheer and Senator Chambers. Senator Chambers, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. President. I said I was going to get some things into the record, and I've listened. This is like a time warp. New people are here. They haven't been involved in the discussions. They don't know what has happened with the death penalty, either in Nebraska or around the country. They're not aware that some federal district courts are very opposed to the death penalty, and they are going to do everything they can to overturn them. There are some circuit courts that are the same way, and if you look at some of the material I gave you, you see where the governor of Pennsylvania put a moratorium on carrying out executions. If you look at the last three paragraphs, you will see that I think the, the circuit is the third U.S. circuit where the judges on that federal circuit are very hostile to the death penalty. Being judges, they see how discriminatory this penalty is. Senator <coughs> Kentner says what he says because he's not aware of what's happening with the death penalty. Federal judges acknowledge it, Congress acknowledges it, the racial aspect to it. The report he cited, he doesn't know much about it because he wasn't here so he couldn't know. But the one who did the report when it was released was not available in Nebraska because he conveniently was on vacation because questions had been raised about the methodology he used, the conclusions he arrived at, so he never answered questions that were raised about that report. But whoever's feeding Senator Kentner this information, it might be the Attorney General, I don't know, much of it is misleading. The Attorney General had a piece of paper sent around talking about the cost. All that he dealt with was the cost to the Attorney General when they handle appeals, either at the Supreme Court level of the state or in federal court. He did not mention the huge expenses that are generated at the trial level, where an appointed attorney is paid for by the taxpayers. That's not going to appear in the Attorney General's budget. It's going to be at the county level, and they are going to pay there was one county, it might have been where Rulo was, that was going broke because they were prosecuting that case against Michael Ryan and they had to come to the legislature to get an appropriation because the cost was so high. You have a brand new man as attorney general, he doesn't know this. All he has is the title and people are listening to what he says, attributing to him knowledge, but he does not know what he's talking about. So he might say, we have one appeal here on a death case. 
but he's not talking about all of the lower court proceedings that do run into considerable money. So let's say you have an appeal at the state Supreme Court level and they send it back for a new trial. When the trial occurs, that person is represented by an attorney. There's a provision for expert witnesses if they are needed, money for investigators if they are needed because the U.S. Supreme Court has said death cases are different from any other proceedings and there are steps that must be taken. That's why a lot of time is taken, not because the states care but because the federal courts have dictated that. So if you really want to get into the nuts and the bolts of the costs, get some of these studies that were done by every state, by the states who conducted them, and every one comes back showing why and how it costs more to get somebody executed than it does to keep them in prison for their life. One that minute is the information. The Attorney General is disingenuous, he is unethical, and if he believes what he's saying on that little piece of paper, he is ignorant about the law as it addresses capital cases. But you all get that piece of paper, you read from it, and you say, this is what the Attorney General said, and that's the way it is. So I'm going to rub it in like I've done before. Had I accepted what an ignorant Attorney General said, you all would not get expenses now. Because I went against several Attorneys General opinions to get you all expenses, and the Nebraska Supreme Court upheld the position that I took and that the legislature took in enacting legislation to see that we could get expenses while we're in session. And that went against what all these attorneys general had said. I decided I'm going to begin speaking because there is so much misinformation being presented. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Chambers. Those still wishing to speak, Senator Garrett, Senator McCoy, Senator McAllister, Senator Reapy, and others. Senator Garrett, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. President. You know, our, I'm, I'm, the, uh, the folks who are opposing the repeal of the death penalty to get up here and tell us about all these heinous crimes uh, that have been committed by people. Uh, we don't deny there are heinous crimes committed by folks, but you're not making an argument. You, 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 what you're doing is you're stating the, the graphic details of, of some heinous crimes, and, and we know there are heinous crimes, and people should pay the, the price for that, and, but they should not pay for their life. But uh, since you want to talk about cases like that, over 70 years ago, 14-year-old George Junius Stinney Jr. was put to death by the state of South Carolina. He was uh, recently uh, cleared of the crime in December of, of 2014, over 70 years later. A lawyer and an activist told a, uh, told a reporter about uh, new evidence that showed that the black boy could not have possibly murdered two white girls, 11-year-old Betty June Binnaker and 7-year-old Mary Emma Thames. Stinney, the youngest person to receive the death penalty in the last 100 years, was executed on June 16, 1944. At five, foot, uh, five feet one inch and only 95 pounds, the straps of the electric chair did not fit the boy. His feet could not touch the floor and he was hit, as he was hit with the first 2,400 volt surge of electricity, the mask covering his face slipped off, quote, revealing the wide open tearful eyes and saliva coming from his mouth. After two more jolts of electricity, the boy was dead. Less than three months earlier, Stinney, who had no previous history of uh, violence, had been accused of the crime after he admitted speaking to the girls when they stopped by a field in Alkalu, where he was grazing his cow, to ask if they could find some, help find some may maypops, a type of flower. Authorities alleged Stinney had used a railroad spike to shatter both of the girls' heads. The boy was taken into a room with several white officers, and within an hour they said he had confessed because there was no mer uh, because there were no Miranda rights in 1944, Stinney was questioned without a lawyer and his parents were not allowed into the room. No written confession exists, only a few handwritten notes a deputy who was present during, during the, from the, a deputy who was present during the interrogation. They claimed that Stinney had said that he killed Mary Emma because he wanted to have sex with Betty June. When Betty June resisted his advances, his story said he murdered her too. Reports that the officers had offered the boy ice cream for confessing to the crimes. A mob of about 40 angry white men showed up at the jail demanding to lynch Stinney, but he had already been moved 50 miles away to Columbia. Even though Stinney's father had helped search for the girls when they went missing, he was fired and forced to leave his home provided by Alderman's Lumber Mill where he worked. 
the court appointed 31-year-old Charles Plowden, a tax commissioner, to defend Stinney. Plowden had, had political aspirations and the trial was a high wire act for him. His dilemma was how to provide enough defense so that he could not be accused of incompetence, but not be, not be so passionate that he would, angry, that he would anger the local white voters who, that would one day vote for him. Plowden did not cross-examine any of the prosecution's witnesses, nor did he call any witnesses for the defense. His entire argument was that Stinney had been, was too young to be held responsible for the crime, but under South Carolina law at the time, 14 was considered to be the age of liability. The trial was over two hours after it began. A jury of 12 white men deliberated for 10 minutes before convicting Stinney. Plowden later told the judge that there was nothing to appeal and the Stinney family could not afford to continue the case. A one, sentence, uh, a one sentence notice of appeal would have automatically stayed the course for a year. Coroner Thigpen had testified that while there was no evidence of rape, he could not rule it out, an, an inflammatory statement that would normally have been subjected to cross-examination. Only 83 days after being accused of the crime, Stinney was put to death. Amen. Activist George, thank you, Mr. President. Act, act, activist George Friesen, who's also from that town, said he had come across the case about five and a half years ago while doing black historical research and was fascinated ever since. The fact that he was 14 just astounds me, Friesen told the reporter. I'm a military veteran and I always tell people that the two things that we protect is our elders and our children. And to have this happen to a 14 year old child was appalling. I was born in Alkalu, where he was living at the time of the incident, and it has always been talked about in the community. In fact, there's been a person that has been named as being the culprit, who is now deceased, and has been said by the family there was a deathbed confession. He added that the rumored culprit had, had come from a well-known prominent white family. Another member of that same family had served on the coroner's inquest jury. Uh, I have a problem with the death penalty because it is irreversible. You find out later that someone was actually innocent, when you go and say, when you go and say we're, we're going to settle a wrongful death se sentence. Time, Senator. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Garrett. Senator McCoy, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. President and members. I, I, uh, I rise, I'm going to make a brief comment to what Senator Garrett just shared with you. That's a horrific story, uh, one that I believe probably makes us all shudder. But I would remind Senator Garrett that that happened in the state of South Carolina under segregation not in the state of Nebraska. We are here talking about the death penalty in the sovereign state of Nebraska. None of us would condone that with the details of this trial that he just mentioned. But that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about Nebraska and the 11 individuals who sit on death row. I yield the remainder of my time to Senator Kittner. Senator Kittner, 414. Well, thank you, Mr. President. I said in my opening remarks, nobody was going to say that about Nebraska. They'd have to go to another state uh, to say somebody was wrongly put to death because we have not done that in our state. Uh, Mr. President, I'd like to uh, pull this amendment. Mr. Clerk. Mr. President, um, Senator Kittner would move to amend with AM 992. Senator Kittner, you're recognized open. Mr. President, I move that, uh, to uh, remove, uh, to pull this amendment also. Without objection. Mr. Clerk. Uh, Mr. President, I have nothing further pending to the committee amendments. Returning to the discussion, Senator McAllister, you're recognized. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. President, and good afternoon, colleagues. Uh, this is my first time on the mic regarding this subject, so uh, uh, I'm a new voice in the, in the legislature, at least on this topic. Senator Chambers is absolutely right. I have not been involved with uh, this issue uh, to any great extent in this legislature, but I did, was involved with uh, uh, justice issues when I was at the Platt Institute during my four years as executive director. And we concluded that uh, the American justice system was in need of a great deal of work. It's too expensive, and we put the wrong people in jail. 
And this issue about capital punishment is also uh, in that discussion. Um, I was privileged to be a part of the news conference yesterday, the conservatives' uh, effort to repeal the death penalty, and uh, I'm glad we made that statement to uh, people in Nebraska. I've been, I should say, very disappointed in the quality of the discussion regarding this topic. People resorted to emotional, gruesome stories rather than looking at the facts in any kind of systematic way. Well, what, do I th what facts do I think are relevant in this, this story? Probably the first thing to look at is the death penalty truly uh, effective as a deterrent. And there's absolutely no evidence that we've seen in that uh, the death penalty acts as a deterrent. Show me the facts, show me the numbers. Secondly, can we show that uh, people that have been uh, convicted and uh, sentenced to death have been wrongly convicted? Yes, indeed, we can certainly show that. There's evidence that occur in the newspaper all the time. So that's another reason we should certainly repeal the death penalty. And uh, so those are the facts. And uh, it certainly is more expensive as well. Some of the numbers we've cited is it costs $30 million to uh, put somebody on death row, where it's three times as expensive as putting somebody in, in a life prison, a uh, sentence of life. So those are some of the facts that I look at. And instead of making emotional appeals that play well on TV, I think it's time to look at this in some kind of systematic way and, and uh, move Nebraska's criminal justice system forward. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator McAllister. Senator Reepy, you're recognized. Senator Reepy waves. Senator Kittner, you are recognized. Senator Kittner waves. Senator Davis, you are recognized. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, like Senator McAllister, I am a little bit discouraged at the caliber of the discussion this morning and the bringing up of the grizzly cases. I get that. I agree. Terrible crimes. But this is about the future of Nebraska and what we're going to do and how we're going to address the issue of the ultimate penalty. So I think if you do a little bit of research, you'll find, and I referred to this earlier, that there are a significant number of cases in other states which are false confessions and or planted evidence which lead to people being put on death row and facing the ultimate sacrifice. That's not where I want to be. I don't want to see innocent people killed to try to rectify some other crime somewhere else. That's just a double, a double hit. So you had one wrong and now you commit another wrong when an innocent person is convicted. So I'm trying to do a little research here on my gadget. And one of the pieces of data I came up with said about 120 out of 3,000 people who are on death row, perhaps up to 120 of those might be innocent people. I want you all to think about that because that dwarfs what we've talked about here. Just absolutely dwarfs it. These are people who are low intelligence in large part, no resources, maybe mentally ill, stuck on death row, and innocent. And at the same time, somebody else is out there free and clear committing other crimes in the world. Colleagues, it's bad policy. It's bad public policy. We need to make a change for the better of the state of Nebraska and for the nation. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Davis. Those still wishing to speak, Senator Garrett, Hilkeman, Johnson, Chambers, Crawford, and Bowles. Senator Garrett, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, picking up where I left off, if we ever, we as a nation, have ever executed one innocent man or woman, that to me is, is, is totally unconscionable, and it, it, it puts the to rest the story about, about the death penalty. It, it invalidates the death penalty in my mind and in my heart for, 
for a just uh, punishment for somebody. The, the, the case I was talking about before, perhaps the most important factor in determining whether a defendant will receive the death penalty is the quality of the representation he or she has provided. Almost all defendants in capital cases cannot afford their own attorneys. In many cases, the appointed attorneys are overworked, underpaid, or lacking the trial experience required for death penalty cases. There have been instances in which lawyers appointed to a death case were so inexperienced that they were completely unprepared for the sentencing phase of the trial. Other appointed attorneys have slept through parts of the trial or arrived at the court under the influence of alcohol. Life without parole is a sensible alternative to the death penalty. In every state that retains the death penalty, jurors have the option of sentencing convicted capital murderers to life in prison without the possibility of parole. The sentence is cheaper to taxpayers and keeps violent offenders off the streets for good. Unlike the death penalty, a sentence of life without parole also allows mistakes to be corrected. There are currently over 3,300 people in California who have received this alternative sentence which also has a more limited appeals process, which lasts approximately three years. According to the California Governor's Office, only seven people sentenced to life without parole have been released since the state provided for this option in 1977. And this has occurred because they were proven to be innocent of the crimes for which they were convicted. When I spoke earlier about where we rate internationally, uh, as number five, uh, I, I'm not comparing our country to, to other countries, but but it, I, I think it, I think it's indicative that uh, that we're we're, we're only no, we're number five for sentencing people to death after after China, Iran, Iraq, Saudi Arabia, and just and we're ahead of Pakistan and Yemen. That's we are better than that. We are better than that, and, and and we ought not be on that list with those countries. We are the greatest nation in the world. And we should be demonstrating that with, with how we act as, as a civilized society. And, and I don't believe we're, we're doing that. We've talked about executions or uh, about what the costs are to ta taxpayers. And both sides are pulling up numbers, and we can pull up the numbers as well. It costs far more to execute a person than to keep him or her in prison for life. A 2011 study found that California has spent more than $4 billion on capital punishment since it was reinstated in 1978, and the death penalty trials are 20 times more expensive than trials seeking a sentence of life in prison without possibility of parole. California currently spends $184 million on death penalty each year and is on track to spend $1 billion in the next five years. But you know, the bottom line, at the end of the day, this is not an economic issue for me. It's a justice issue, and it's a moral and ethical issue. It is immoral for the state to be taking people's lives, and, and we're politicizing that punishment. Mr. President, I yield the rest of my time to Senator Chambers, if he would like it. Senator Chambers, one minute, 15. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Garrett. I'm not a Catholic. I'm not religious. I cannot profess to speak for any religion, so I'm going to read from the testimony of Greg Schleppenbach. Good afternoon, Senator Seiler and members of the committee. My name is Greg Schleppenbach, S-C-H-L-E-P-P-E-N-B-A-C-H. I'm the executive director of the Nebraska Catholic Conference and testify on its behalf in support of LB 268. The teaching of the Catholic Church does not condemn use of the death penalty in principle. The death penalty is not regarded as intrinsically immoral, 